Thank you very much, Brother Stephen. Hotep, my sisters and brothers, Hotep. Brother Stedman left out, left out one thing he didn't tell you. He could have put away some of the things that he did tell you, but he didn't tell you that we shared the same room when we went to visit the Nile. And it was that's where we became extremely friendly. Sam, Reggie, and I, we were almost inseparable. And it was um, one of the wonderful experiences I've had going to the land, going back to source. And um, it has always remained in my mind. I've always said that we may know, we may read about Kemet, the motherland, but when you go there, it gets into your blood, your African blood, and it becomes a kind of guiding light, the spirit of my heart. And when you come back to these shores here, you can scarcely go back and be something that you never were, something in which you were trust by those other people. In other words, you're bound to remain African all throughout your mortal life. I want to say that the Haitian Revolution is something that I'm sure everybody here has heard about. I'm positive of that. And it is not only the Haitian Revolution, it's also revolutions that took part up and down in this hemisphere that was responsible, finally, for us liberating ourselves. It was not the help of abolitionists sitting in London and Paris and elsewhere and going before the parliament that caused the slave trade and slavery to be abolished. No one can free you accepting yourself. And it was more than that. Up and down the Caribbean and the Americas and North America, called the United States now and Canada. It, every day from the time the slave trade was inaugurated or started up until the plantation system broke down, was destroyed, dysfunctional, caused to be dysfunctional by our ancestors, ourselves, that we abolished and we freed ourselves. Dr. Eric Williams likes to bring out in his book, Capitalism and Slavery, and tell us, which is quite true, that the abolitionists, played a part, but a part that was rather late in the freeing of the slaves. And it was very revolutionary at the time when he wrote that book, around 1936-37. In fact, that book is a, an extension of his PhD that he wrote for Oxford. And I can tell you he had a lot of trouble to get that subject published and to be accepted for his PhD. One of his professors told him, no English scholar worth his weight in scholarship would for one moment think that it was not the abolitionists that set the movement of emancipation afoot. And we would not accept the fact that the slave system was broken down by the resistance put on by the enslaved Africans. And you would have to have concrete proof. He was counteracting something one of their great historians, their quote unquote great historians had said, a man called Coupland, that it was the abolitionists and the Africans did nothing to enslave themselves, to disengage themselves from slavery. You know that is bunkum, that's rubbish. It's not even worth talking about at this moment. 
However, that was the belief. And that belief has been held up to now. But from the time on the coast of Africa to almost, not to almost, right until quote-unquote emancipation, Africans were fighting the plantation system everywhere. In America, they like to tell you that they, they like to quote for you three of the slave rebellion, you know, Gabriel Prosser, Ben Marquisi, and Nat Turner. They love to do that. But what they don't do, they can e equally well tell you, and, and your research can make you find that out too, that they were over at that period from about 1831 right up until the eve of the Civil War. There were over 250 recorded slave rebellions. 200, you can go to the Library of Congress and find it any time you want. But they talk about three in periods from about 1800 to 1820, 1822. That's they talk about that. But it was going on for a long time. They don't talk about the Underground Railroad, in which Africans were continually leaving their plantations through people like Harriet Tubman, whom you know very well, Frederick Douglass, and others and going right up into Canada to escape the system of slavery. That was happening all the time. It happened from 1831 right up to 1855, just a few years before the Civil War started. Africans were doing that. They lost a lot of money and a lot of our people who went into freedom into Canada. Many of these later on went to Sierra Leone when they formed that free colony in Africa. Many of them did. So it was a continual thing. Even when Africans here took part in the American Revolution, they took part for their liberation. They didn't take part to get rid of the King of England and all his laws and all his stamp duties and his tea duties and all of that. They didn't fight for that. They fought for the liberation. And they did it cleverly because some fought on the side of the British and some fought with Washington, after Washington had seen that the war was going to be lost, they were losing the war. The American Revolutionary War was being lost up in, in 1775. He sent, Washington saw that happening, and he sent a communique to one of his generals, Putnam, telling him, if we could only get 3,000 trained Negroes we could stop the war tomorrow morning. And that is when they agreed to have African brothers in the Revolutionary Army. And it was then that the war began to change, change its, its tone and, and, and its movement. Because up until that time, when they asked for, I, that is why on the 4th of July, I feel a rather sick quality coming over me to see them with their firecrackers and all those things and talk about the spirit of 76. There was no spirit of 76. By the time 1776 came around, you know what they were doing? When they wanted, they were being beaten so badly by the British at that time. When they asked for soldiers to be sent to fight with the colonists, you know what they said? They would send old men or little boys. They said, no, we can't leave our plantations and leave those big Negroes on the plantation and send our red-blooded Americans to fight this war. Think of what the Negroes are going to do to our women. They always talk about our women. You know, one gets sick of hearing about it. And they would not, they were, they were people leaving the army, men running away, leaving the army, and running back to their, their plantations. And that was when Washington himself, in a communique, it's there to read. They won't read it to you, but it's there to be read. He said that he has never seen a place where our great American men are deserting like cowards and leaving their war to be fought by slaves. These are the things you should remember when the 4th of July comes around. And they're doing all their, their big, you know, the Americans like to play games. You know, they love to play games. Like the games they're playing in, in, um, in um, Saudi Arabia, which our young women and our young men are going to pay the penalty for their games. You know, myths. Americans live on myths. They live on television. That's about all they live on. 
Anyway, to go back to what I'm saying, is that from the beginning, there has always been people, our people, our ancestors, who fought against slavery. From the time the ships were leaving the Bight of Benin in Africa, they were, they were uh, already starting revolting right in those ships. They would revolt so much, one of the last things they would do, they would come on top of the decks for fresh air, and all, they would jump in the water and commit suicide, take their lives rather than come across here. Many, many of them do it, did it. That's why you could always tell where the slave ships passed because there was always a school of sharks following the ships because they knew that their, their lunch and their breakfast and their dinner was safe. They knew what they were going to do because our people would not, would refuse to come even on board the ship. They would be, they couldn't leave them free for one moment because they wanted their freedom. And when they reached the plantations, some of them were never even slaves in Suriname. The Jukas would come right to the waterfront, and the minute a slave, slave ship brought the slaves on shore, they would attack the slave the soldiers on the plantation. They would attack them and take these, take these Africans and bring them right into the forest farm. So many, many an African who is in the country of Suriname today never knew what slavery meant. Many of them in the islands like, in, like Haiti and so on. The minute they come there, the Akans, especially dealing with the Akans and the Ashantis, these were warrior people. The minute they came down there, they would they immediately take them. They would, they would do the most, bra the bravest acts just to take their people and bring them away so that they wouldn't go through slavery. And there was, a, there was, a, there was slavery rebellions and revolts on every single island in the Caribbean from the beginning to the end. In fact, before, before 1833, 1840, 1886, 1880, before those dates came along, the whole plantation system had broken down. They had what they called the absentee ownership. People had left the plantations, and that is how many of the plantations have come down to the people who now own them, the descendants of the people who had first taken them over. So let us not think that the Haitian Revolution was something isolated to Haiti. You must get in your mind that it happened everywhere. They had Quilombos, the brother was talking, they had Quilombos in Brazil. One of the most famous Quilombos they had there was Palmares with Zumbi, I don't know any of you saw the film, did, with Zumbi and the, the priestess, the Asherin, you remember her? And it was a fantastic film that showed you how Palmares, how Palmares grew and how it lived. One of the things you found out when you watched this thing, they not only Palmares, they had Palenques, they had Mocambos, they had Maroon Societies, they had them all over the Caribbean, Brazil, Cuba, everywhere they had it. And these, these freed Africans didn't remain free and say they're going to hide and stay and remain free. No, they went back to plantations and, and took their slaves, enslaved Africans and brought them there. And they didn't hide. They lived openly. They would come down to a shop. And while they shop, on a Saturday was the day when they all went to market. When they go to market, mingling among the slaves would be some warriors. Some, when there were women warriors, too, don't think there was only men. There were women, were African women warriors. There. They would mix with the people and spirit them back up with them, take them away with them. When they would bring the troops there, even though they had troops around the marketplace, they didn't worry. They would come there and, and one by one you would see the soldiers. If a soldier, soldier made a point of moving alone somewhere else, he was a dead man. Soldiers couldn't move around on their own, own at all. Even when they went two by two, the African brothers went around two by two as well with them, so they could deal with them. Their lives were in jeopardy the whole time. These are things you must remember. They didn't sit on the comfortable behind and say that they're going to free them. Not at all. It never happened that way. And this is one of the things that you, we need to know. We need to know that we were the cell, we ourselves freed ourselves. The passing of those laws was in the last minute when they passed these laws, already the whole thing had broken down. And they started to say the price of sugar had gone down in the world market and all those lies. The price of sugar had not gone down at all. Because when they could not get Africans, and they could not get people from Africa, what they did, they got Indians, and they got Chinese. The Chinese didn't want to work. The Chinese wanted their laundry shops in Kingston and all those places. They didn't want to work in the bush. And so they got, they got people from India. And the people they got from India, they, it, they lasted 
they call it indenture ship. This thing lasted in the Caribbean until 1917 when they abolished it. So if the price of sugar was going up and down in the world market, and you, ab and you, you abolished slavery, and you emancipated slaves way back in 1883, 1840, 1886, why did you keep this law with, the, with these people up until 1917? Don't you see it's like one of their big colossal lies? These people are the most monumental liars in the world. And the Haitian Revolution is going to prove it to you. I'll show it to you just now. How there was nearly, the revolution perhaps would not have taken place. You, there was nearly no Haitian Revolution. And I'll tell you this why. The Haitian Revolution shows us, it shows us all aspects of our lives today. Everything that happened then has happened to be. It did not begin, the, the way it began was a curious way. What happened was that after the French Revolution, the French Revolution that's in 1789 to 1791, what happened? There was the government, the, the monarchical government had been abolished, and they had the government of the people. On the colonies, in the colonies like Haiti, and um, it wasn't called Haiti at the time, it was called San Domingo, San Domingo, but Haiti, Martinique, and Guadeloupe, it was still, the government was run there, the colonists, the people who had plantations, were still of the old school. They were lords, they were viscounts, they were marquises, all the aristocracy of France, and the big men of the Club Massiac. They were the ones who had the plantations, the colonists. And all the money that was made in the island of Haiti at the time, of St. Dominique, I'll call it Haiti for, for, so we don't get mixed up. On the island of Haiti, there's the money that was well, the wealth, the, the tremendous wealth that was being made was being made by the elite of France. What they call them in Haiti at the time, the gros blancs, the big blanc, the big gum. Um, any Haitian here? No? No Haitian brother or sister here? No? Brian, I see you nudging someone. Is she Haitian? Who got Pali Patwa? We? Oh, we. That's what, co that's what colonization does to you. It with all kinds of things. <laughs> <laughs> and um, what happened is the Goblins were the ones who owned the big estates. And they were making the wealth. France was making from Haiti at the time, 1791. France, 38% of the wealth of France, that's nearly half, right? 38% of the wealth of France came from Haiti. They call Haiti the queen of the Antilles, the pearl of the Antilles, all kind of names. You know, white people call you all kind of names for money, you know, the greatest people on earth, you know that, don't you? And Haiti was producing all that wealth from France at the time. And the Goblins were not going to give that up at all. And what happened is that the and brothers and sisters that were there had already known what had happened in the French Revolution. Now, the, what happened, the colonists, the people that had made all this big money said, now, we want to be independent. As the colonists in Haiti said, we want to be independent, not the Africans. The Africans were just watching this movement, what was happening. They said they wanted to be independent. The officials, the government members of the Haitian government that was a French government anyway, said, no, we are not giving you independence unless you, you, you belong to the, to the, to the party in, to, in, to, to the party in France and um, the system that we now have in France, the system where the monarchy broke up. And these elites wouldn't do it. And they were giving, they were giving a lot of trouble. So guess what the French government, the, the General Assembly as they call it, did in Haiti. They, again, they said they would use the enslaved brothers and sisters. They said, what we're going to do is that we're going to pretend that we're going to the slaves. We're going to pretend that we're going to kill the slaves, fight, fight against the slaves and kill them. But what we're going to do, we're going to send them into the mountains, let them stay there, and at the same time realize our soldiers will take hold of the plantation. Because the colonists, the plantation owners, don't have an army, and there were only about 22,000 whites on the island, and there were 450 Africans there. So they said, we are going to 
show them that we will take them over and we'll send the, the, the slaves won't, the, the African brothers and sisters won't take part. They'll stay in the Black Cayman in the northern provinces. They'll stay up there. And what we will do is when the whole thing is over, we'll let them come back down onto the plantations so that by that time we will have, we will have taken the plantations from the colonists. What we will do, and we'll give the slaves an extra day to work, and we will make things easier for them. That is what they plan. And they said that the king of France is still in favor, and there was no king of France at the time, because they had broken down. The king of France is in favor. He has signed a, 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 a document to that effect, that he will free the slaves, and that he's going to make sure that the slaves live a happy life. No, can't see that. You know who they got to... Um, to try to sell that idea to the slaves. This is what happened before the revolution. They got Toussaint the Vecchio. Toussaint said he would act as a leader with the slaves and make them see what they say, where we'll meet and see what they say about that, whether they will accept that from the, the French government, and it was on the, the colonial assembly in Haiti, whether they will accept it. Bookman! New. You know, they got a news, they had published in a newspaper, a false, a fake, artificial newspaper in Paris, and sent it down with the kings, that the king had granted all those things. Big lies. And they said the only person who can let the, the slaves will listen to, the brothers will listen to, is Toussaint at the time. Because Toussaint, fortunately or unfortunately, we have it both ways, was a fairly well educated person through his master, Baron, um, Baron de Libertad. He was an educated fellow, he was there, educated him, he knew everything, he was a Catholic, a devout Catholic, as I will tell you later, you'll see what I'm talking about later on. And he was the one they would listen to, but the man who knew that that wasn't true, that it was a spurious thing, was Buchmann Dada, the powerful, powerful priest. He knew that, that it wasn't true. So they met that night, the night of August the 14th, to discuss it. They got, they got African brothers and sisters from each of the plantations, from over, over a hundred plantations in the northern provinces where the sugarcane plantations were. And they all met that night. But Tusa began, Tusa began to talk about this. But, um, after a while, the news spread around that it was not true, it was furious. And um, Toussaint immediately moved away and let Bookman take over. Because he moved away from that and he stayed right on the side. He did not take part in it in any way. That is Toussaint. Because he realized, not that some people say that Toussaint didn't do it, Toussaint was doing the best thing that he thought for his people, that's what they said he was doing. But you see, the thing is this, he was so indoctrinated by the French way of life and Roman Catholicism that he was not prepared, he was not prepared to do battle against the whites at that time. And in fact, when he decided he would take lead the leadership, take hold of this thing, was when his his, his um, owner, Libertad, and his wife and his people were safely put on ship and sent to this country, America. They were came in there. That is when Toussaint decided that he would move into the revolution in Bihar. But already the revolution had started. Already it had begun because the man who began it, Bookman, had already organized the people and they began to go from plantation to plantation. And especially when they reached the Noe plantation, the last place, the last, last plantation they reached, hell broke loose. The overseer and the owner of that plantation had been a devilish person. In point of fact, he was the one who, was, um, had, who had killed and quartered one of the famous leaders called Mackendall. He was the one. And when it reached that thing, the slaves, the African brothers and sisters, it just, they just went crazy and began to burn and kill and so on. And then that night, it was the night of the 22nd of August, 
1791. The whole northern plains of Haiti, all you could see was big conflagration, fire everywhere you looked, you saw fire. They burned down. By the time that a couple of months had passed, they had burned down. There was a 100,000 Africans involved in that. 100,000 Africans on the plantations in the north had got together with their machetes and their whatever, and that was that they were really havoc there. They had, they had destroyed 200 sugar plantations, 200, 600 coffee plantations, and 220 um, indigo and, and cotton and other plantations, and they had killed out almost the whole of the, the whites that were living there, and then the revolution had started in real. But at that time, the man who really was the leading light was Buchmann. And another man who came up, although he was there, Toussaint would, by that time had joined, it was Jean-Jacques Desalines and Buchmann that began to run this thing. They had other leaders. They had people like Clairvaux, um, Beaupart. They had um, um, Jeannot, Jean-Francois, Biasso. They had powerful leaders there. But one of the things, again, the lessons when we're revisiting is a lesson we have today. Those leaders were fighting for position. They were fighting, jostling in, with, in what position they would take. The only one who could curb them, the three men came out of this thing as the leaders. Well, after that, Buchmann lost his life because Jeannot and Jean-Francois had gunned him, had gone after him and gunned him because he was the real powerful man behind this thing. They went after him. But again, Desalines was too elusive. He was too clever a man. They called him a savage, they called him ignorant, but he was too clever a man to get caught. Then Tusa came in, and another powerful fellow came in at the time, Henri Christophe. That's a cool, calm, and collected individual as well. He came in, and then they could get rid of Biasso and all those others. And it was those, after that, when, when Buchmann died, it was those three men, but particularly, Toussaint would lead the revolution, and he had a tremendous military genius. He knew the, ter the terrain, he knew how to fight. But a man who was, like he was trained, but an, a man who was instinctive, who fighting to him was like breathing, like he could, like they said he was born a military genius to fight, was Desalines. Desali knew everything about it, and it was the fact that they had him. And many people don't talk about him to the extent that they talk about Christophe. The other man they had to the south, around Jacques Mel, was Christophe. Let me tell you the kind of man Christophe was. And you can see the kind of leadership, the kind of things that we have. In that kind of, it wasn't a one leadership in the Haitian Revolution. It was a collective leadership that won that that, that revolution. It was not one man. As I say, it was a collective leadership. That's the thing which we cannot understand even today. A collective leadership. It's not one brain alone is not good enough. In this hall, there's not only one brain. There are many brains here. All will come out with something, but then we have to distill that thing in a leadership that we know we're going to do this, you're going to do that, I'm going to do that. This is what happened. In the, in the Haitian Revolution. They could do that. And the thing is this, Toussaint's trouble, as I've said before, and lots of people have, are now saying, Toussaint was not African enough. Toussaint was a Frenchman with a black skin. Toussaint was a Catholic with a black skin. He was too French, and he was another thing. He believed, he believed in the equality of man. With one of the people he read, you know, one of the, he read um, da, um, a, um, Abbe Reynolds, the Bishop Reynolds' books, uh, dealing with the equality of man. How can you talk about the equality of man when there's slavery? How can you talk about equality? There's no such thing as an equality of man. It's the same thing here. All men were not born equal while those stupors and those liars were saying that here. They had a lot of slaves here at the time when they say all men are born equal. Their constitution and their independence 
their, their, their independence, you know what, as the Frederick Douglass said, what they should do with it. It's not even worth that kind of paper. Christoph was a third hand. He was a man of the world. He had traveled. He came from Grenada. And he was a man of the world. He had traveled about. But the thing is this. He could read white people. He wasn't fooled by them. He could read them. And he knew how to. He knew their weaknesses more than they knew anything about. He knew every little weak thing about the white people. Because he was working among them. And he had been around the place. He had traveled on ship with them. And been living with them. So they can't fool you. You know? Once you live with them, you see there ain't nothing to them, you know, really, you, you, it's a fact. I lived in England a long time, and you know, I was, I was never fooled. And uh, Christoph said, one of the things he said, to show you the kind of man he was, he was a man who was stern, unafraid, cool, calm, collective. That's the kind of man he had. This Alain was calm, but he could, you could rise him in a second. He could chop your head off and you don't even know your head will be talking over there and your body will be there. You know, that's the kind of man he was. A strong man, strong within himself, but he could, he could cut back and, and be calm like nothing. He could deal with you, he could talk to rock and roll, he could talk to them, but he knew how to fool them and how to get They tried their best to do it, but I'm, when I'll give you some incidents in a minute. Um, uh, a man called Hugh Cathcart. The captain on a ship complained to Toussaint that he should, um, what he should do to Christoph, because one of his men from the ship, the ship's captain, had been beaten. Christoph beat him, beat him personally. The ship's captain. It was the British ship that was helping them, helping the French. And Christoph's men at the time, that the camp, because he protested, the captain of the ship protested that he, uh, he was forced to transport Christoph's infantrymen down to Port-au-Prince. That's what the English captain of the, of the, of the ship of war said. Toussaint promised he would set, give, get Christophe to apologize. When he meets Christophe, General Christophe, he, he tells him that Christophe and Cathcart was there. He wanted to talk to him in, in front of Cathcart, Captain Cathcart of the, of the ship. You know what Christophe said to Toussaint and to Cathcart? He said, um, but you know Mr. Cathcart, Captain Cathcart. If the master of the ship had been a Frenchman, he was an English captain of the ship. If the master of the ship had been a Frenchman and had conducted himself in that manner, I should have shot him out of hand. You're lucky that you're English. That's the only thing that saved you. And he walked away from Toussaint, he said. That. He walked away from his general, his colleague, his general. The same thing when Toussaint, when Toussaint got a lot of his generals and his soldiers angry because he executed his nephew, who was General Moise, for the way Moise is supposed to have treated white prisoners. He executed him. That alone showed you where Toussaint was coming from. Toussaint believed in fair play, in treating prisoners. Desalin told him straight out. Desalin said, he said it in Creole, Brother Toussaint, I am not here to play the white man's games. I don't want to count prisoners of war. I don't keep prisoners of war. I chop their heads off. That's what he said to Toussaint. And that's why they call this alien a monster. They call him a beast. They call him a savage. But I'll go on more with that with you, but to show you what it means. So it is along those lines that we have to see three powerful men having with strong personalities and having to fight that revolution. And there were traitors, there were others. Desalin had, as I say, one word. Desalin had more than one word, he had um, four words he would usher. He would say, he spoke to his regiment, if you were not brave and you could not face death, Desalin would not have you in his regiment. And he issued this four words to them. Every time they went on a battle, on a sortie, he said to them, I, he said, beginning, I do not want prisoners. 
I have only four words I'm going to tell you. Cat mo money to you. As we said in Creole. Wile Kai, coupe tet. Burn houses and chop off heads. That's all I want. <laughs> And it is that kind of attitude that won the Haitian Revolution. Had not to say had to go, but in a sense it was good. In a sense it was a good thing. Because Toussaint had served his purpose. He was a great, great general. He was a man who had a level head and everything. But then, unfortunately, he was too Frenchified. And this is the thing that caused him, this is the thing that caused them to take him and arrest him and take him to France on a ship called the Creole. And he never saw Haiti again. He died in a jail in the mountains of France called Jouet. He died there. When he was going, he was asked, Toussaint was commander-in-chief of Haiti at the time. He was commander-in-chief of the island. And the French generals sent to ask him, to, they would like him to come and have an audience with him. They would like to talk to, to talk to him. And will he come down to their headquarters? Can you imagine that? You're fighting against these men. You don't cut their behind. And they are asking you, the people, the white people are so devious and they lied so much. They've never kept a treaty that they signed with any black nation on earth. They may have done it in the moon, I don't know, but they haven't done it down here. And they are calling you and asking you to come. And you go with two little, your little privates on a, on a horseback. And you go into them. As he gets into the, to the ante room, the front, the front room, um, he stood there waiting for them to, well, he's a, he's a general. They're waiting for them to tell him, oh, um, General Toussaint, would you sit down and so on. They kept him standing there for half an hour. He said, well, he can't see, he can't see the general, the people who said to call him. A priest the one was, was one of them that got him by false means to, to, to come down, a priest, you know, a Catholic priest. So he's standing there. All of a sudden, soldiers rushed from nowhere and, and <coughs> clapped him in chains. Put iron chains around his feet and dragged him out and put him on the ship called the Creole. Desalines said he had warned him. <laughs> Christophe said, had already told him, if they had, if they asked me to come, and in point of fact, I wouldn't go. But if I was disposed to go, I would go. With 3,000 of my crack men, with right. me yeah. on horseback. Right. And I'd make them ring the headquarters, go a form a circle around it. And I give them, I'll, when I'm going, I say it's nine o'clock. If at half past nine, I don't come, up, come out of there. Smash the place up, kill everybody you see. That's what he said. Even Petro, Alexander Petro, who was a, a mulatto, even that man, he said, I don't see how citizen Tusa could have gone. To them, when he's a slave and he, know, they, he knows how they hated Negroes. My father is a white man. I don't like my father because I don't trust him. I know he hates me because I have Negro blood in me. I wouldn't go. Toussaint, the great Frenchman, officer and gentleman, which is what he was, goes. The rest of the story. This is one of the lessons they wanted the lessons. When these people cannot beat you with arms, they try to buy you. They try to want to form a treaty and tell you things are good, that they'll do this for you, they'll do that. How are they going to do this? You already have the country, it's yours, it's in your hands. How, what, what they can do for you? <laughs> the only thing to do with them is kill every one of them, that's all. <laughs> but what, you, what, you, what, what, you're going to, what are they going to do for you? They can't do anything for you, they can't do anything for themselves. But that's one way of getting out of it. It's the same thing, even the famous Rocambeau, the famous Rocambeau, General Rocambeau from France. When La um, Napoleon sent his brother-in-law, General Leclerc there, with 30,000 crack, crack, crack troops, 
Napoleon had beaten all of Europe. No, Europe was under his hand. And he sent his best troops to Haiti. He said, oh, they should get rid of the, you know how he called it? He used to call people black people or Negroes. He used to call them, say, macaque, monkeys. That's what he called them. He liked to use the phrase monkeys, macaque. To kill the macaques, he, he said. He sent his brother-in-law. When his brother-in-law died on the soil of Haiti, and those Frenchmen, all of them, their bones are in Haiti today. They all died there. They were killed. They say some of them, yellow fever, got them. Yellow fever didn't get all of them that were there before. Why are you starting to get them now? You know they like to lie and say, you know, you know where their AIDS thing, AIDS come from here, then every, anywhere does black AIDS come from it, you know. You know that they're big liars. And so, when that didn't succeed with Leclerc, his brother-in-law, the clerk was married to his, his own, his sister. When that general and them died, he sent a worse man. The clerk was savage and bad, but he sent a worse man, the worst general, Rochambeau. And Rochambeau had to kill all the generals. Some of the slaves who had fought with them in the army and put half slavery there, in, slavery would be in Haiti for as long as it's French, it's going to be there forever. That is when Desalines said, we will take over. When Toussaint had been just sent to think, you know. And when Rocambo came, he issued this problem, this, he issued this statement. He said, I am going to kill Desalines with my own hands, personally. I'm going to put him to death, bit by bit by bit. He sent out a communique so that Desalines could get it. I'm going to take his one ear out first, then the other one, one eye, the next eye, one nostril. And so he was going to do Desalines. This is what he said. You know, this is a great big Frenchman, you know, God, believer in God and all that kind of thing. This is what he said he was going to do. Desalines told him, said, reply to him, you will never do that. I will get hold of you. And I don't even know anything bad enough to what I'm going to do to you. <laughs> and um, when Desalines took his men in charge, he and Christophe, they are pitched, they took, he took charge on that November of 1803. He took charge. He broke away from there at a place called Akai in November that year. And when they were going to fight under the banner, and they said they were going to fight under a new flag, Haiti hadn't got his flag yet. You know how they said, well, they said, General, what flag are you going to use? One of the, so the soldiers on the horse, but had the French flag, the tricolor there. This, and this, I told him, bring it here. He brought it. He ripped the white out of it. He says, that's the flag of Haiti. He ripped the white out completely. They said he was so paranoid. Desalines was so paranoid, and rightly so. If we here are not paranoid about white people, then we're crazy. <laughs> because you look at it well, it happens throughout the years. Desalines then said to his men, we're going to take over. Then the last battle he fought, one of the, well, one of the terrible battles, he fought that last battle. And one of the things he had to do before, when they were, they were, they had round out, they had had them in, under siege. Desalines came out and said to his men, I want 24 men who are prepared to die. I want 24 of you who are prepared to die. I'm not going to pick you out and let you come out. 24 men that are ready to die. If you're not ready to die, don't come forward. Step forward, 24 men who are ready to die. I am the 25th anyway. And he said, I'll stand first. He stood there to the front. He said, I, 24 men. And 24 soldiers came out. They could get more, but 24 of them said, we have a job. There's only 25 of us going to do it. I don't want the rest of, I have some other plans, um, some plans for the rest of the regiment. I only want 25 of us who are prepared to die. And this alien did one of the most tremendous things. He says, and we're not going to use our guns. We're not going to use it. I want each one of you to sharpen your cutlass. And with that, on the midnight of that night, 
there is an inventor with those men. And they so frightened the French troops that were waiting in trenches and so on to go at them. And the French were, were, were preparing to go just after midnight. Desarin had beat them by a few minutes to the punch. And he, they leapt at them in the dark, midnight, with their cutlasses. And all they could see, they said, the French said afterwards, the French had wrote about that, they could see gleaming cutlasses and gleaming teeth in the dark. <laughs> And they dropped their guns and ran. They dropped their guns and ran. And Desalin wiped them out. The troops just surrounded them and wiped them out. That was the man that won the Haitian Revolution. Toussaint was not there. He was the man. The man they called a savage. The man they called this. The man they called that. He won it. Rock and bow. Now he set out to look for rock and bow. He said, I don't want anybody with me, I'm going alone. I'm looking, we're going to get him. And I want you to, I told them where you were to wait for him. He wanted to be alone. He drove everywhere, his horse everywhere to look for Rock and Bow. He says, I'm going to deal with him. By that time, Rock and Bow knew when the, the troops had, had retreated and ran. You know what he did? He made them get him on a British ship of war that was in the water. Get him quickly. I don't want to stay here at all. I want to go. They put him on the ship and had him away to France. He wouldn't stay there because he knew. This Alain said he knew what I was going to do to him. And um, when Rock and Bull wrote in his papers later on, although he said about Toussaint how um, about this Alain, they called him all kinds of names. This is what he said about this Alain in his papers, the Rock and Bull papers. He called him also, but one of the things he said, and he had to agree, he said it up somewhere around them. I have the letter now. He's talking about rock and bow as a yeah. This here. But he's saying that um, we're talking about our military brilliance. We're talking about how we're great military men. He says, but we are only children compared to Desalines. Desalines can teach us everything about fighting. We come nowhere near him. And one other thing about him is that he's a very, very, very clever man. He will fool you. And a man who hated his guts has said that about him. It's in the papers, in the Rock and Roll papers, you can see it. He says, his generalship, none, we are fourth raters compared to him. He said, even Toussaint, learn from him. He had one thing, Toussaint was strong, was brave, was indomitable, but Desalines was like iron and steel and boulders of rock put together. That he had that, that final edge of spirit that many of the others were lacking. And um, Toussaint was no mean guy with his, with his, he was cool and so on, but he was no mean guy. You couldn't bend him at all. So the same thing with Christophe, these three men. But when they tell you that about Desalines, so I say, I say that it is the fact that they had, that Desalines was there, that the revolution came 13 years, 13 years, and the man was there. You know one of the reasons they got rid of him? Now the thing about it is Desalines, when he became Emperor Jean-Jacques I, you know what he wanted to do? He decided, he would give all the plantations to these ex-slaves, these people who had been slaves on it, and the peasants who had worked it. He was going to share, he began by sharing the estates, the plantations to everybody. But again, you see, that's one of the, that's one of the good things about it. He, he had a, a um, constitution, he drew up a constitution that was like a, you could even call it a socialist constitution where he placed a lot of things in the hands of the people. That's what he did. Before Toussaint left, he had had a constitution. And guess who composed on the constitution? The whites. Mulattoes, who did not particularly care some of them, and the whites. They were the one, white officials and the people, some of the whites who had fought. They were the ones that helped Toussaint draw up a constitution. 
And the land was to go back to the people who owned it. But the only thing is that Toussaint said that none, uh, no black man would work as a slave for them. You'd have to work for wages. Now I ask you, does that make sense to you? You fighting those people, you when you drawing up a constitution, and you are expecting them to take back the same people that they had a slave. Come on. You know, that's where Toussaint's mind was so confused. That is a kind of Negro mind that we've had for a long, long time. A lot of us, not only now we have a Negro mind, you know. From even there, Toussaint had that kind of mind. Toussaint could not identify as an African. He could not. It was Desalines who could identify as Bookman. Because look how Bookman began. began. Steady read you the, 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 the prayer that he came out with. He came out with that prayer because he said, um, you know that the white man's God has committed crimes against us. Let's drop the white man's God and take up our own God. He was talking to Dambala. He was talking to Leg, but These are the people he was talking to. Trying to get the spirituality and the invocation in the Africans there to, to fight. When British troops are fighting in America, they're not praying to God. Are they praying to the Pope and to God? No? The Pope gives them blessings. You know, when they went to Abyssinia, so there's not a Pope that was giving blessings to all those Italian troops, you remember? Those of you who are, well, if you're old enough, but the younger ones should know that by history. That the Pope that blessed the troops that went, what, Pope you know, uh, Pius XII, he was the Pope that blessed all the troops going. And you know what they did to Abyssinia? They put that, they, they think that, um, chemical, bio, bi biological warfare against our people. All sorts of the poison gas, all of lots and lots of our Abyssinian people in the 1935s and so on, when many of you were not born and you were not even ideas in your mother's and father's heads at the time. So when that happened, that's what they do. They pray to their gods, don't they? They pray to the, to the God, the same God that had created all, that, that, that had caused his priests and his so on, the same God that Las Casas was praying to when they, they, they wiped out the Caribs and the Indians in the Caribbean. And the same God that they were praying to when they got Africans, Las Casas and others, got Africans to come and work the plantations of the Caribbean because the Indians were not used to that nonsense. The Indians were born down there, the Caribs in the sun, and they're not used to the sun. What makes them so different from Africans? They got to get Africans because they say they, they're used to the sun and they can take hard work. It's only we are the only ones that can take hard work. It's about time we, 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 we change, change the shoe and put it on the other foot. <laughs> and so, to, to, to go back to this thing, it was Bookman who gave this, and Desalines who gave this thing an African feel. Because Bookman himself said somewhere, one of the things he said is that, um, if I can refine it, um, he said, um, he said something about the, this being about, about Africa, and I wanted to, to get it for you so that you could see See how he felt. Ah, yes, he says, Bookman rushed to Des Desalines uh, when they were fighting at one time. And he said, um, they were again giving, they were giving their, to their troops a kind of pep talk. And Desalines said, I, Desalines, will disembowel every planter in Saint Dominique and drape their entrails on the chichat trees that we have in Africa, I will gorge out their eyes and feed them to the fishes. This is what Desalines said. You know the kind of man he was. <laughs> Bookman said this at the same time. Bookman said, we cannot return to our native Guinea. See, you're thinking of Africa all the time. We cannot return to our native Guinea. These cursed whites have brought so many of us here that we are like the seeds of the muka trees. A thousand ships could not take us, all of us, back to Senegal, to Ghana, that's the old Ghana he's talking about, to Zamb Zambezi, to Somali, to Katanga, to the hundreds of rivers and forests of our native land. And so we make this Haiti, our, um, Saint Dominique, our Guinea. This land smells like Guinea, it looks like Guinea. We shall burn the cane fields, smash the maceros, destroy the boiling sheds, and we shall kill all the whites. We shall, the, the Grand Blancs, the Petit Blancs, even the Mustis and the Mustafinos, we shall drive them into the sea. We shall run them into the hills and slaughter them. This land belongs to us. We shall kill Les Blancs, kill them, kill them. 
Who goes with me? Who goes with me when he was exhorting them in the early stages? This was the kind of spirit. It was an African spirit. The spirit that we need to have today. If you have, if we have a Negro spirit, we'll be treated like Negroes. And you know how they treated Negroes from the time Negroes came in their hands. And once you believe and you, 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 you come back, you get your African spirit or your African mind, you cannot go back anywhere. The only place you have to go back to, whether you live here in New Jersey or in London, you have to go back to Africa in your mind, whether you go there physically. There's no other place to go to. You can look at the map until you're blue in the face. You will not see Negro land. There's no place you see a map called Negro land. You won't. You'll see Africa. You'll see other places, but you're not going to see Negro land. So anybody who is a Negro is citizenless. You don't have any land. And you see, the only land you have is what the man has given you. And the man has given you and given us the, that kind of land because he knows we are not people, and we never were in that point of fact. We were once property. You remember? You were slavery. We were property. Like beasts and cows and a desk and a book, we were property. Not even as good as a book. So I'm saying, we cannot go back to anything else but to ourselves. Once you find your African self, which is what Desali had done, which is what Bukman had done, and which is what all the soldiers who fought, unfortunately, Toussaint did not have that. He had everything else. Like a lot of Negro achievers we have here at colleges and universities. They're brilliant PhDs and DDTs as Dr. Jeffries likes to say, and LMOs and OBEs and everything. But they're not African. They're not. They can't help our children. They can't help our students. They're only helping the system. Toussaint would have helped the system the same way. He wanted them to live on the land in peace with them. How can that happen? White people don't want peace. They want money and they want power. And as Frederick Douglass said, power conceives nothing without a struggle. It never did and it never will. So this is the kind of thing our young people need to know, this true thing. The mere fact now that they're fighting hard against a curriculum. I don't want to include it in any uh, a curriculum to be included with us. I want our old curriculum for our old people in our old book. Not in there. The book are too, too full of lies. How can you have, how can we have that? How are they going to present the Haitian Revolution? Already, they have presented a false picture of the Haitian Revolution. They want to hide the African quality in that revolution. It wasn't the Haitian Revolution of one Caribbean island. It was a, it was a, it was Africans. Like Africans in Dominica, like Africans in Jamaica, like Africans in the south, or in, 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 in Georgia. And, uh, and Tennessee and everywhere, fighting for liberation. It was no such thing as the people of, of, of Haiti wanting it for the people everywhere. In point of fact, Toussaint had one good thing in mind. Toussaint had said that he wanted not only Haiti to be free, he wanted the whole of the Caribbean to be free, but not the kind of freedom he was talking about, because we cannot live together with those people. Integrated, unfortunately, with them. We go all about we the same thing, although the north is no different than the south. Once you're south of, south of, of Canada, as Malcolm said, you're in the south anyway. But the thing is, is we live, how much closer we want to get with them in their bedroom? I know some people want to, but you know, how much closer you want to get to them? And in any case, if you listen to what they're saying today, I heard Commissioner Sobel, I was at the conference, I gave up. Um, I gave a, a presentation in, in Atlanta a couple of weeks ago, and Sobel was there about the curriculum, a 29-page presentation I gave. Sobel was there. He heard, he heard Dr. Jeffries, he heard Dr. Issa Hilliard, he heard all of them. And I heard him. I stood there, Dr. Jeffries jumped down his throat, and at the end of it caused a big ruckus, and I was glad of that ruckus myself. But um, he said he does not, he's not against having African-Americans included in the curriculum, Hispanics, Asians, 
Native Indians. But the curriculum must be Eurocentric because the mainstream of life is a Eurocentric one. So it means that we still be tributaries, tiny little tributaries in this mainstream. Well, he can keep his mainstream and he can know what he can do with it. Because that's what we don't want to be their mainstream. Their mainstream is a mainstream of lies, pollution, poison. That's what it is. And how are they going to get our curriculum, what we want, in a book that they have already told so many lies about Africa? They have denied Africa. Everything. How, how are they going to put that in the book now? From saying Africans are, are no good, Africans are this, they come from trees, they that, they that. How are you going to put those things in a book? You're going to look like a big jackass. And they're not going to look like that for us. So we have to do our own business ourselves. We have to teach our children. I don't care if it's one child, whether there's one person around here. Teach the person. Teach. That's what we have to do. So that by the time our children get into schools, they are not going to be telling Asking the teacher, well, where if the teacher says, well, um, you know, it was Edison who, who invented the uh, light. Say, well, no, no, teacher, you're missing, uh, missing something. I'll tell you, well, what about John Latimer? You know, and then put her on the, on the carpet. Then she has to answer that if you have a new curriculum. You've got to put Latimer, you've got to put all our people in it. What you going to do about it? You've lied so damn much and you're going to put them in it? What you going to do? So I'm saying, forget their curriculum. We the way we're, we're going on now, we're making sure that there's an African curriculum going to be presented. But it's not what they think it is. Whether they use it or not, it's going to be published, and it's going to go to all the people we know where it should go to. And there's going to come a time. By the time the turn, this century turns, you know what? Young people are not going to the next century with this Negro business in their mind. Don't you believe them? Those are There are a lot of our people who uh, it's difficult to deal with them now, but you see, there's a funny thing with human beings, especially human beings who are African. When they see how the land is moving, where is moving, finally, those that have not been moved will move. Don't worry, they will move. They will move. When they see where the grandchildren, the great grandchildren, and everybody is moving to, all people are moving along those lines. They're not going to stay on the side because you know what? White people will not want them. White people don't want them anymore. White people only want you to labor for them. That's why we came here in the first place, my brothers and sisters. Why we came here? To labor. You think we came here to have um, all those big things to have uh, the riches of, the, of whoever that, you know, the Kennedys? We didn't come here for that. We didn't even come as people. We came as donkeys and cats and dogs because they, we were property. So let's be quite clear about it. And it was only an afterthought that they began to give us citizenship. It was an afterthought. They tried all sorts of places to send us to. Haiti, Liberia, everywhere they were thinking to send us, excepting to stay here. You know, after you don't fight, you don't, you don't pick up with your beautiful little fingers, all the time they wanted to send us somewhere. And all those people start coming from Europe, those poor people, those poor Irish, those dirty Czechoslovaks, all those people that Bush is making a big fuss now. They came here, they couldn't read. You could write your name as large as the wall, they wouldn't read it. <laughs> Dutch himself said his father couldn't read and write. And these are the people in power today, the Italians and all of them, all of them. And they didn't, you know, they, they hurry come up. Only recently they become a, as far as Africans are concerned. Africans are here from the beginning, even before them, Africans were here. So what are you talking about? You looking at? If you want to go to Africa, you go to Africa. You don't want you stay here because your blood is here, your sweat is here, all of that is here. You work this place, and so I don't. Um, I don't feel that we should we should think that at the beck and call. If we we're good enough, we're good boys. They'll give us that. Do like this. I mean, take the place from them. Take it. That is what Bookman and them were talking about. Toussaint, like for instance, I'll give you a, an instance of Toussaint. Toussaint, for instance, on the 9th of August, his thrust, as I say, was an, his ideological thrust was not African. He waged a war, as I told you, in which he wanted equality with his French masters. That is what he wanted. He was prepared from the very beginning to allow whites to live on the island. Desalin and Bookman said, no, it was 
drive them into the sea. We don't want them. In fact, right that same night when he was presenting that, he moved away. He moved away from the function, the voodoo, voodoo function that was taking place at the time. And in fact, when the massacre of the whites began, and uh, they, were, they had the ceremony, you know what? It was said that when Bukhoin was handling around and Defile was the, was the priestess, she had been a girlfriend of, of Desale in Defile. She was a powerful sister, very, very powerful sister, as brave as Desale. She was the one that was handing over the, she had slit the throat of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, of the goat and her, the blood was coming out. And Bukhoin handed Tucson, the goat, to take a, you take a sip, you know, from the, from this. Tucson refused, and he began to say, he began to intone from the records, it said, in nominis patris et fili et spiritu sanctu, amen. This is what he began, Latin, you know, if you Latin. This is what happened. Fine, fine Catholic. He would not take an active part in the ceremony, the wooden, he would not. He stayed on the side. And um, he was, you know, he was even full of misgivings at the time. For instance, um, Bookman and Defile were the ones that were, had, had the ceremony going first. You know, they were, they were, they were the priests and priestess taking part, taking thing in the ceremony. That he hoped, the, he said at the time, he felt at the time, he hoped that the warriors that were there would not follow Bookman's path. That's what Tusa had said, you know. And he even prayed, at uh, the time, again, he was praying for that. He was saying the Hail Mary full of grace. He was saying that when the ceremony was on to Ogon and, and Dambella and Legba. He prayed to, to, you know who's God? The God of the white man. That's who he prayed. The very God to whom Bookman had been crying vengeance. That's whom he was praying to. And as I said, Tusa's supplication, begging the white man's God, was to no avail because the revolution just took off after that ceremony. It just took off. And our ancestors really went to town with what they had to do. And it's the fact that they could do that, because had they drawn back and waited, like Toussaint wanted, then the troops, the French troops, would have roped them in. But by the time they got news of what was happening in the Bois Cayman, in the northern provinces of Haiti, thousands had died already. And the soldiers themselves when they came, they didn't know where to look for the slaves, the, the, the Africans who had taken part. What happened? Our ancestors, although they didn't go to no city college or no, no um, New Jersey college or anywhere, but they were very bright people and clever. You know, they moved off. They, they stemmed in town. They gave stories to, they got, had agents who played like they were Uncle Tom's to give stories, false stories to the soldiers. And they told them they were everywhere, but so they were spread everywhere looking for people. When night came on, you know where our brothers and sisters were? In the forest, when they told them where to come, they were in trees. They literally <laughs> went in trees. And when those troops came, they were looking in the dark for trees. They just jumped down and they went, whoa! And they massacred them. They had to run. Every time! They could face guns, but one of the things they hated most was the cutlass, to see a powerful black man like Desali with a cutlass. You know, that's terrifying enough, you know, for them. And especially, Bookman was a big muscular, he came from the Arada tribe, big powerful muscular man. And they were afraid of him when they saw him, you know. And he liked to wear only a shawl. He left his chest, was all his whole top was always exposed. So you can imagine to see this man, they were afraid. Afraid of them, you know. There's a did the same thing. He was always fighting. He said he's not used to guns. He's used to cutlasses. And he'd have a gun to revolvers. He kept to shoot any traitor. Anybody who was a traitor, whether it was men or not, he would shoot them. And I think that's the lesson. I wish we could learn it today, <laughs> because of many people amongst us who deserve to be well. Boom, 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 bang, bang. <laughs> and so the the. The thing when the, the revolution went on, it took, but again, you see, Toussaint began to change. When he saw what the French troops were doing, he began to change. He saw need, all that violence he was talking about, and extreme. well, look, war is extreme, the is a, a conditions of extreme, right? Well, you need extreme remedies for an extreme disease, you know? So 
Bookman and Desalin only did what was not natural at the time. You couldn't have, it's not a game. Toussaint thought like the French people, it was a game. When you took prisoners of war, you did this, you, come on. That's, war is not about that kind of thing. And I know some people are going to learn that if they keep going on where they are, they're not. They're going to learn it's no game by the time they finish. And unfortunately, there's a lot of our people that's going to learn that too, unfortunately. And Tusa began, he said, well, I have a, a quotation of his, where he said, he began to realize that you, Bookman had told him, again, repeated to him that same thing, prayer he had brought up. He said, he, he had told you earlier, Tusa, throw away the image of the God of the wise. He has brought you a lot of tears. Throw that God away and take your own God. Tusa would not hear. He would not hear it. And, uh, but eventually, when he saw what was taking place, he realized what was taking place. He began to, uh, he admitted it, he said it. If I can only find it for you. He said he made a statement, which is the, one of the good statements that he made, and he realized how, where he was going to find it. Um, he told them that his name is Toussaint, and he's, he's been leading, and he now sees that the white man cannot be trusted, and we have to fight him. We have to fight him now, but um, fight him as, as well as we can, and fight him for us to have victory. He realized that at one time. But then again, Desalin and then began to go even further, you know, because what was happening is one of the things that Leclerc did, what they would do to stop people from, um, our African warriors from doing anything, they would, they would find, they would pick out they go to any of the towns and pick out a woman, an African woman, who was pregnant. And they would, all the Africans that they had trapped, they would keep them in a ring, especially around the, the glass, uh, the, the, the glass des Armes and these other places in La Cap. They would have them, they, they would pick, pick, um, put pickets on them, their arms exposed, their legs with their legs open, and they would have them on the on the floor, lying on their backs. And what they would do, they would force every, every child, children, men, women, to stay and watch this. And they would take a lot of raw meat with blood on it and put it on, on the African woman's stomach and let, let loose some dogs that were hungry. Some of their hound dogs, well, you know the rest. There's nothing, I don't, can't even talk about it. And they would do that. So Desalin, when he found that out, he said, um, this is by there's only devils that can do that. But there's always somebody stronger than the white devil. The black one. <laughs> there were some terrible atrocities done there at the time. But when they write the history book of the war, that is what they bring out about what they are in there. They don't tell you what the clerk and rock and roll is. I have a, a piece that I did, a, a, you know, a dramatic thing on that piece there, where they were, where they, they, had, a, they had blacks, Africans, sitting around and watching. It was so bad that this priestess, Defile was there. Um, they had them all, when they, before it started, Defile watched and so it was so bad that the sister couldn't take it. She let out, everybody was silent in that square there. She let out a terrible scream and she couldn't take it. And the man who, and they said, the man who rushed to her side and put his arm around her to console her was Desali, the same monster. That man could be calm and put his arm around his sister to try to quiet him down because she knew if she screamed again, they would, the, the, the hangman was there. He was only going around picking people and forcing the others to watch, and there was just only chopping their heads off, mm. doing that. And that's what they were sat there around there watching. And um, I, I have it somewhere there. But it's a gruesome sight, what, what they were doing. Desalines was there, and it gives you a pretty good picture of what Desalines was like, even when he was there. The amount of beatings he had taken. He had taken innumerable beatings from his masters and from people who had done. Uh, who had it, with the different masters that had it. There's a scene that he, that um, he took part in, or not he, that he and all the leaders and so on were there at that time, when they had not begun, they had not yet begun 
the, the revolution, and that way they were, they had been, it had been, been, was being planned, and if I can only see, it would give you a pretty good idea of how brutish the, um, it, it, the whole thing was. The Zalin endured countless beatings, and I see some of it here, he adopted countless beatings, and um, when they tried to convert him to the Christian faith, for instance, by dragging him and several other Africans to a Jesuit church, he refused to budge, although he was in chains. That's before he, the revolution started, you know. He covered his groin with his hands where a whip, uh, whip stock hit him with a stunning blow. He heaved the contents of his wretched stomach and doubled over in pain. The brutish driver clubbed him and mercifully again and again and again. This and it fell on his knees, his lips a spongy pulp of red, one eye swollen shut, and the other blinded by a rivulet of blood. These beatings were inflicted on this with regularity, but he refused to do whatever they asked him to do. The fact that he remained alive alone. You can imagine the beatings they're giving. Look at the beatings they're giving Larry Davis now. They're doing it in this day. The beatings they're giving our people everywhere and killing them. So you can imagine the kind of beatings they must have been the victim. This is one of them here. And that is why Des Alim said, that is why on the night of when the revolution started, he said, I, Des Alim, will disembowel every planter in San Dominique. I read it for you a while ago. And um, the first to spring, um, it was this, um, this kind of, oh yes, at the Place Dam, and they had a, they had a big execution, uh, uh, they were, a big execution going on where they were, they were, they were, they were going to execute some African brothers and sisters. And the Place Dam was, was this square where they used to do that all the time. And um, one of, the, one of the, the persons that was there, I said, was, um, was De Filé. She was, uh, she was a Creole from the wider, wider people, the Widers in Africa. And she was a tremendous beauty. She was the daughter of a wider woman, an um, African woman, and a white man who raped the mother, and Defile was born, was a mixture out of that. But she was a tremendous, they say, they, they say that she was a tremendous beauty. She had uh, she, an African beauty, they called her, the one that I told you was the priestess. And on the, she, a plantation owner took her as a mistress, as 13 years old, took her as his mistress and imprisoned her as his mistress. And Defile herself, when she got older, she stayed with him some years, when she got older, she, um, she escaped. Um, she took, she went, and she had an African brother as a lover. When she was discovered, the planter, in a frenzy of jealousy, lopped off her ears and slashed her vagina. She managed to survive and get better, and once more got out of his clutches. She became fearless and lived the spiritual life of a priestess with the people. She could foretell events. Everyone knew her and felt somewhat frightened when her prophecies would come true. No one other than Jean-Jacques Desarais was ever seen with her. And um, across the Place Dam where they were doing this thing, Desarais rushed to her side. He put his arms around Defile to comfort her. Anger bristled in his muscular, powerful body. Christophe recalled the first time he had seen Desarais manacled, chained to a coffin, his dark body naked, head swollen from incessant beatings and streaked with red, a throb of blood on his lips, and his eye in full blaze with frenzied anger. The anger that he was, he was to use later on. At the Place Dam, the day that they were executing these Africans, it was strange to see Desali comforting someone. The molten sun shone directly overhead. The executioner stabbed at some of the men on the torture wheel. There were men on torture wheels going round and round, and they were whipping them and torturing them and stabbing them. And uh, all the African brothers and sisters were seated around like they're watching a show, you know? And um, getting no response, he swung his heavy sabre and hacked off their heads with total indifference. Defile cried out again, and Desalin put his firm, strong hands over her mouth and stifled her screams. The executioner jammed the severed heads on pike staves, held them up in the air, and descended from the scaffold. Revenge was etched on the features of every African in that square in Cap Francais. It was not only for Auger and Chavan, but all Africans involved in other words, um, that were involved in that. And that is the kind of scene they would put them through all the time. Um, is that Desarin endured, I, and I read that part from you, countless beatings. And it was, these are the people that were there. When the executioner slashed off the head 
and, the, uh, and had tortured Vincent Auger, one of the men that had fought earlier, one of the, he and, and Jean-Baptiste Chavan. When they did that, and they, they took them off the scaffold, they, they were standing near a cluster of pear trees at that time. Again, she let out a scream that rang through the air and startled everybody. Desiree again put his hand around her. They had been forced by their tormentors to stand by and witness the grisly and macabre execution of torture. With him too, with the, the Chavan and all the other African men and women that had taken place against her, they were there and they were tortured and put to death. And Africans, children and babies and mothers and everybody witnessing that. And this is the kind of thing that they cannot put in history books to tell you. They cannot put it down. Henri Christophe was there too. He was seething with anger. His eyes ablaze and seeking to catch the attention of other leaders. He noticed Bookman, big-chested, powerful from the Turpin plantation. Jean-Francois was next to him. They stood motionless but fired with rage, trying to contain themselves, awaiting their time from the moment they had chosen for this massive onslaught on the plantation. They were just waiting for that. Especially, you could see that they were seeing the anger. They had planned this in array, but anger was bristling them as though they wanted to start it straight away, you know, when they were witnessing that. And then, all, all the people there, Christophe followed, the, his, his eyes followed, swung around to where Toussaint was sitting. Toussaint sat there, immobile, impassive, his face without emotion. But his eyes, his black eyes, were banked with volcanic rage. He could see that. He, only by his eyes you could tell that he sat there completely seeming, you know, calm and cool. But his eyes was blazed with rage. And then all eyes turned to Dayfile again. Everyone, as I said, everyone knew her. She was a sharp brown color and a, 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 a beautiful face and so on. And that, and that was the time. That was just before. So you can imagine going into the into the Wakeman, with all that just has happened before you. You can imagine how ready they were for these people. They, not, they were not going to show them any kind of peace and love and anything after witnessing all of that. They were not going to take it. The brutality in Haiti, it was true people say it wasn't worse than it was anywhere, but it was bad. It was really, really, really bad. And like Slavery everywhere. There's no gradations in slavery. It was bad, period. There was no good slave, bad slave. There was just, it was just B-A-D, bad. That kind of condition. It was like a concentration camp, but only worse. And some fool of a scholar, they call him one of our black conservatives, um, what's his name, um, Thomas Sowell, wrote a book some, a few years ago called Ethnic America. And he said that Negroes. He doesn't call them. It was published in 1982. But when they were not using the word Negroes to define, to describe ourselves, they were, and he was using throughout the book, he used the word Negro when people were using black at the time, you know, and, uh, and Afro-American. And, and he never used that word once. He spoke about Negroes all the time. And you know what? Some of the things he said, he's supposed to be one of um, Reagan's chosen conservative, black conservatives. I know what I could do to black conservatives. It's not even good to say it now, you know. And he said that the only place Negroes learned culture was on the plantations of America. Can you imagine? This is an educated fool. There's, a, there's another hyphenated word I'd love to use. It starts with the first letter of the alphabet, but I can't use it. And you know, this man said, it's like saying that if you go to R Rikers Island, you will learn culture down there. You know, the only thing is in your mind is how the hell to get out of there, you know? You're thinking of ways and means to get out, fear, foul, or whatever. Murder is not short, you're not short of murder. You want to just get out of that place. And he's saying that's where we learn culture. You know, I'd be ashamed to say that. And he's calling himself a scholar. He went to a school up in um, Colgate to lecture the, the um, the black students up there, they ran him out of the platform. They ran him out. You're an African yourself, and you can stand there and say that. Somebody should come with a paint of white paint and splash it all over the place, you know. Because it's terrible to have people to say these things. That's what they need. That's what they, that's what they want, you know, those other people. They're saying those things, and when they, have, they hear black people say that, they feel justified. This is one of the lessons, again, the Haitian Revolution taught us. 
you know, that we cannot in any way afford to be split. There must be any disunity. It was unity that made the Haitian revolution, them win that revolution and get their country. Unity that did it. And they had a way, as I say, they had a way of treating traitors, but unfortunately we can't use that way today. There should be some, I should, I could try to invoke the spirit of Mac and Dad who use poison to see how we can do it, you know. But um, it's terrible when you're trying to go on when you have some people coming the other way. And it means, you know, you see, what they really don't understand. If you agree with white people in any way, you are not thinking as superior and inferior. They are thinking as superior and inferior. They're going to say, the reason you have to agree is because you're inferior to them. And they will never accept you on a grounds of superiority on equally. If they have superiority, there must be inferiority going with it, right? The two opposite poles. So when they're talking about superior, you know who they're talking about inferior? They're looking at us, all of us, whether you're professors or whatever you are. They're looking at you as inferior because the fact that they enslaved us for hundreds of years, they will never think otherwise. They have to be beaten into the ground. Desali knew that. Zumbi knew that. Bala knew that. Zombie knew that. And all the others who took part in the Revolutionary Wars, Gabriel Prosser knew that, Nat Turner knew that, then Mark Bizzi knew that, and a lot of people, some people today know that, but a lot of our people today don't know that. We'll never get anywhere, never, never. To know very well the things that have been done. I was at the conference on, on, on a couple of Fridays, of, 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 well, I went Thursday to Saturday, and Everybody that spoke there, everybody, even, what's his name, that commissioner, that fool of a commissioner they call Sobel, he said, oh, um, Dr. Jeffries and, and Dr. Hilliard have given me some books to read, but you know these books are rather difficult, I'm taking my time, be patient with me, which books, now every time we can have, has read the story legacy, and all of us have read these books, that big fool in education for 22 years, he says, give him chance, a chance, liar. <laughs> Give him a chance to read those books. And he's a, he's a commissioner of education. You think we're going to get anywhere with a fool like that? Maybe not. And this kind of thing, there's some of us, I know a lot of people have to do this thing for their job, but even so, Desale didn't have a job, Desale was going to lose his life. And all those people are going to lose their life. At least now you may not, you know, if, uh, if you can sidetrack side and stay away from cops and in, in people in blue, in blue uniforms, you might get on, you know. But I mean, your life, they will, if, if for saying something and for doing something, they're not going to take your, they can take your life, but not in the way they could do it in those days. Take your life, chop your leg off, do cut your ears, do anything they want to you. And yet these men were prepared to do it. It's not one or two or three or four leaders, you know, that fought the Haitian Revolution. 450,000 Africans fought that revolution, you know. More than they have in New Jersey here living. There are 450,000 of your brothers and sisters here. Yeah? But anyway, they, they fought. They fought and, re and freed themselves. It's the same thing. They had uh, Mokambos and these plantations, uh, these uh, maroon societies. And not one of them was ever conquered. Not one of them. The minute they would do something, there, the brothers and sisters would be up again. And so they had to come to terms with them, agree terms with them to be able to exist, not for the benefit of the brothers who had, who had lived a life of a free life, but for themselves. The minute they made this contract, they want to make contracts and agreements with you, they lose it, they're weak. The minute they want to do it to people that they think is inferior. You know what they said when they were fighting the Revolutionary War? Turner and, um, and these other generals were saying to Washington, fancy. Our lives now depend on our slaves. The safety of our, of our country and our lives now are in the hands of slaves. You know, those people are really, really ungrateful. We blacks risking their life in that in war, and they're turning them that their lives, you know, they're being, they're, their lives are being made safe by their lives. The lives of America now are being made safe by our boys and girls that are over there in, in Saudi Arabia. That's the same thing now. But you notice when they show films or they show um, television things, you hardly, you, most of the people you see is Dick and Jane sending messages to Dick and Jane, Mammy and Kathy, wherever they are. You know, 
That's who they're sending a message. You might see one of our, our brothers somewhere on the side and so on. He's always, Jane, I hope you're well. I hope the baby is fine. I hope the baby is well. <laughs> and so this is a kind of, of lesson we have learned. And it's not only a lesson from the Haitian Revolution alone. It's a lesson, it's a lesson of liberation. These resistance movements we've had in all these parts of the world, that's what we have to understand. That is why, because whatever we have to do to release ourselves, we have to do it ourselves. And again, Desali knew that. All those warriors knew that. And um, people nowadays know that, although some of us decry what they're doing, it's not what the force they have, you know. It's the good that they're doing for us. Whether they are Muslims or what have you, all of us exist. But we all have a common struggle. All of us, and that struggle is our Africanness. Whether we are Baptist, Jehovah's Witness, or what have you, or, or heathens, or whatever, we all have that struggle. When the cop looks at you, he doesn't see no Caribbean, he doesn't see no Jamaica, he doesn't see no East Orange, he sees black, black, black. And he goes, split your head open no matter where you come from. Once you have the badge of identification, and we all have the badge of identification. You may think inside there's another badge, but the policeman can't see the badge. He can't see the white badge. He's going to see the black face. That's what he's going to see. I'm going to knock the black face to smithereens. <laughs> but let us remember that. That's a lesson we have to remember, the lesson of getting together. You may not like Sharpton, you may not like Maddox, you may not, but these brothers are doing something. Yeah. Let us all in our way do something. Short statement from Desalines. Desalines talks to Toussaint over you and he's giving Toussaint advice and, and passing on this advice to you, brothers and sisters. I need the advice myself and I always keep it in my mind and will pass it down to you. And Desalines talks to Toussaint over you. Some things we do not need. Before we were created in this land, cravats and powdered wigs, we did not know. Some things to some make sense. Only in some places, food we will grow, homes we will build, our women and children we will protect with blood. With blood we make them free. We are all we need. We are all we have. We will sustain us. Thank you, my sisters and brothers. Like to get into his class? Thank you, Professor. Well, if you blinked, you missed a lot, didn't you? Uh, history is repeating itself, unfortunately. And the second time when it does repeat itself, it is going to be more serious than those whom it affects. In other words, we don't seem to learn from the lessons of our brothers and sisters that went before us. And yet that is so African. If we believe in the ancestors, the ancestors who have been doing themselves and are supposed to be there to guide us, if we believe in Mahat, the what color of truth, that we live that kind of life, we should be really believing in what has happened. Because we nobody is exempt from that. Nobody. And it's always there. That's why the ancestors sort of tell you and guide you not to fall in those parts. They have a saying that they take, uh, you must take a backward look into the future. You might think it sounds paradoxical, but a backward look, in other words, you've got to see the road that you traveled, and on that road that you traveled, there were lots of obstacles, and you still have more roads to travel, 
And maybe some of the same kind of obstacles would be on the roads ahead of you as they were at the back of you. And so are the ancestors. So you know what to do and how to deal with them. And that's the lesson that we still seem not to have got together. And we seem again to be easily taken in by what those people who have had our lives in their hands to do whatever they want to do. They still, we still have some kind of belief in them, a belief that um, what they're saying is true and that they mean well. They really have never, never meant well. If you look at the history, the history of the Caucasoid peoples, you will notice there's been a history of aggression and wars from time immemorial, from the very beginning. And it has the same thing with Af they did with Africa. They came to Africa, and that was one of the worst things that will ever happen to Africans when Europeans got into contact with them. And we are still suffering from it. You may think it is only us now, the Africans who are in the uh, diaspora, and not the Africans who, have, who, uh, who managed to stay home on the motherland. But even so, Africans, Africans suffered as much internally as it has suffered externally, because we are the, ex the extensions of Africa at home in Africa, and we have suffered in the same way they did. You must remember, it's true they didn't have the kind of slavery that put them on ships where they had to go thousands and thousands of miles in the most atrocious conditions. But when we left, our ancestors left Africa, they left people there still. Many of us may have, you know, who knows? A brother may have been taken as a, as a, as a slave and brought on a ship. His other brother may have stayed there. So it means that there are people here who are directly not only family, um, extended family, but are blood family, blood brothers to lots of Africans who are on the continent. You might have had your father's brother, your great great grandfather's brother, may have not been caught and brought here. Your grandfather, great 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 grandfather came here. How come you, do you know if you really have relatives in Africa? You do. We all of us have relatives in Africa. Unless we come from Mars or we came from a test tube, but we all have relatives there, and it, it is, it's closer than you think. Those that stayed there, remember too, millions of Africans, sometimes I think the latest figure they give now is about 110 million Africans that have taken throughout those centuries. Who do you think they took over there? Young people, the majority of them were young people who could work, the labor force, who you get in the labor, you know, when you get elders in the labor force, you take some elders to help to guide the younger ones, because the younger ones coming from Africa will listen to the elders. But the ones you took were young people in their prime of life, young men and young women. And worse again, the women were taken for more than one, one reason. They were taken for other reasons, after dark reasons as well, you know. They were taken for many reasons. So you can imagine the young people of Africa were taken from Africa. Whom did they leave? Whole villages were destroyed, disrupted, families were disrupted. They left Africa in a king chaos. So Africa suffered as much as we as Africans suffered here. So it has been a global suffering we've been through. And what is worse, they didn't have that kind of plantation slavery. But by 1884, 1885, you remember when they had the Berlin Conference and the Port Caution Park parceled off every lot of land in Africa. There was German East Africa, British West Africa, French Cameroons, German Cameroons, Chinese Cameroons. There were all kinds of things in Africa, except in real Africa. Every major European country had a slice of the land. So again, you can see Africans didn't have their country, could not develop their country, could not control it. That is why these people have the nerve to say today that Africa is underdeveloped. You know why Africa is underdeveloped. Because they had Africa in hand for its mineral resources and from all the, the riches they could get. It's the same thing with the Caribbean. They turn around and say the Caribbean is underdeveloped. Who was there due to develop it? These were the people that were there. They didn't develop it because it was, they, they didn't look at it as home. They looked at it as a big kind of factory where they could produce sugar and, they, and go back to live in England and go back to live in France. And they, they, the, the fact that Europe became technologi technologically advanced was through the workings of the sugar plantations and the cotton plantations. That is where it came from. Even the great Winston Churchill, great for English people, could write in his book, The History of the English-Speaking People, and he said, were it not for the sugarcane plantations in the Caribbean and cotton in the South, there would not have been, the, the um, Industrial Revolution would not have taken root in Europe. 
Europe at the time of Columbus was an arable place. It was land poor, resource poor, people poor. That's why Columbus came out looking for gold. He didn't come out, he lost himself at sea, but uh, you know, he, came out, he didn't come out for, to, to, to plant that sugar plantation. They were looking for gold. And he said he came to look for, for, for Japan and so on. It's gold they were after, the gold trade they were after. And that is why Europe had nothing. Europe was not industrialized. Up until the 17th century, Europe was not industrialized. It's later on, it got winds, when the sugar cane and, and the cotton and these things began to be put to be planted on a, on, a, on a productive scale. That is when Europe began to move ahead forward. There's some places in Europe today, even now, if you go to Hungary, you'll never see poverty in your life in Hungary, like you, in, in the West, in, in the Caribbean, like you'll see in Hungary. I went to Hungary some years ago. I had to go there. I was invited to a, a conference, a, a literary conference they had in the Pen Club. And, but that's because I had, write, I had written some terrible poems and stories about colonialism, and they wanted me to come there and talk. So I went there and I started to blast the English and blast, and try to blast all of them. And I went in there. I went to the friend from the information, the Minister of Information, Kawan Doshi was the minister, the director of information in the, in the Hungarian government at the time. He took me to see where his father lived. He took me a weekend to, to, to see his father and his mother. The house didn't have any good in that television for a start, and there was television already. Right? In, in the 60s, I went to, 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 to Hungary as this guest of the Hungarian government. The place was backward, and, and in the time, you know, drinking wine and having something to eat, some kind of black bread they make there that you have to have good teeth to eat the bread, and cheese and all that kind of thing, and wine. So I asked, after a while I'm sitting there talking, and I asked to go to the, the restroom, the, you know, the John. So Carmen said, okay, come on, I'll take you. The man takes me in the yard, and I have to walk to a little house in the, in the yard. And I said, he said, yes, that's where you have to go, winter and summer. I said, come on, help me. He says, no, we, we, we can't afford When I went there, I'm thinking I'm going to see, uh, you know, you, you, you turn a knob or something. I said, I wish turn a knob. It's an earthly thing that's there. I said, thank you. You know, in the winter, I would have to die because I didn't go out there <laughs> to, do, to do that in this place. And they're talking about other places. When they talk to you about Europe, they show you the, they show you the, um, the Champs-Élysées, they show you um, the Eiffel Tower, Notre Dame. These are the places. They have a lot of nasty old little places I can tell you that they don't show you. But when they have to talk about Africa, you know what happens. We don't even go into it. And so I'm saying that this is the kind of thing that we have to put up with. And I don't see why, 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 that there's some of our people who cannot see further than that. They cannot go back to Kemet. That's what beats me. They can't go back to Nubia. They can't go back to Ethiopia. Where it, the, all the action was, that is where it was. Not only there, in the Sudanese empires, all over Africa. That is where the development was. Every single, every single Greek philosopher learned his business, his trade in Egypt. In fact, there was no such thing. We were talking to uh, Dr. Theophil Obenga. He did, his, he did a big piece at the meeting, at the conference we had a few Thursdays ago on the question of Greek philosophy. And there is no such thing as Greek mythology. There is African mythology. There is no such thing. And he goes back, he takes the word all the way back. He goes into the etymology of the word. He goes into everything. And there's no such word. You can look up the, the Greek dictionary, the Greek, and you will not see the word philosophy anywhere. It is not a Greek word. It comes from Egypt. The designation of the word broken with Dilo and, and Sophos is, comes from Egypt from Kemet then. And they talk about Greek mythology, Greeks of philosophy. All the Greek scholars, with the perhaps exception, they're not too sure about the exception of Socrates, they all of them studied in Egypt, in Kemet. They say it. Some of them studied 10 years, some seven years. In point of fact, Pythagoras was there 22 years. So you know where he gets all his geometry and things. If they were learning at the time that you something that they said is so difficult for us Africans to do. Calculus, that's where they were learning calculus in Egypt. I don't have to tell you anymore about it. That's where it all comes from. To tell me that you can ignore that. Not only 
European scholars have written about that too, you know. It's not only uh, European scholars have written that. And even the European scholars that have written about that, they have downgraded them. One of the latest ones, you know, is Martin Bunnell, whose book, uh, Black Athena, has been published. He teaches at Cornell. He comes from, he's an Oxford, you know, professor. He's teaching at Cornell University now. And he brought out that book. I'm sure you've seen Black Athena somewhere. Do you know what? Black Athena, they were, had to publish a second volume, volume two. And the, and the publishers here who published Black Athena were going to publish, they had, well, they had signed a contract to publish the second volume. When Black Athena came out and they got such an unusual response, particularly from black scholars and so on, they sent back the, the, the volume to, to Burnett and said, sorry, they can't go on and for some false lying reason, they can't publish it. They won't publish it. Even one of their own kind, you know, because they're showing Africa there in Greek business, they want to send the manuscript back. These people are the biggest liars. And you know, if you don't know, I, I know that from personal experience when I was publishing my book. They really wanted to kill me. In fact, I got threatening letters from the Ku Klux Klan right in Waco, Texas, when I came out with some fact. The, the British broadcast, I gave a, some public broadcast in England. The lines were jammed. Who is this Edward Scobie? Where does he come from? Who is this man saying these things? Why does the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, allow itself to hear these this rantings and ravings by this man? Today, this ranting and raving, every Tom, Dick, and, and Jane from England is publishing, is writing the same thing that I've written, and they're quoting from the book that I wrote. These people, they're liars. When I tell you that, I know they're liars. They can't go further than that. It's the same thing. How many of you remember when King Tut, the, the Tut exhibition came here? I, I defy any one of you to tell me, with the exception of Gil Noble, that you saw anything that he was black on any television show. Never. You wouldn't think so. They told you everything about Tut except his color. I remember I watched Channel 2 purposely for that. A drug addict called Jim Jensen on Channel 2. <laughs> I'm trying to did a half hour pro at the end, I'm not lying about it. Man, you know. He did a half hour show on King Tut. And all the time I'm waiting there, my ears are pricking me, waiting to hear black, black or something somewhere. Not the man skirted round and round the rainbow. Never said that. Not one of them. I went and I was looking at the exhibition, going to the Tut exhibition near the um, the Museum of Natural History. One long line of white people. I don't know if you ever saw these of people going into the exhibition. They never said, and look, that's well, Queen Thai. If there's anyone blacker than Queen Thai, it's five past midnight. The lady, you can't miss her. And they never had anything about that. You know? They hid that. When are people can do that? These people, these people are criminal, you know. They're criminals. There's only criminals can do a thing like that. In the face of everything, like now they're avoiding all the forensic evidence on that case in, in, in Central Park, you know? Yeah. They can do as though it never happened. Yes. And I have no doubt that those cops put those words in those boys and did exactly what those boys said. Rub your, sh your shirt, on, in, 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 take a piece of blood and rub it on your shirt, on your, on your, you remember that? Take some blood there and rub it on your clothes. The brother refused to do that. I believe it. I believe he said that. The boy is not imaginative enough to say that kind of thing. Because he wouldn't even perhaps know why they want him to do that. But he's smart. His African intellect told him, don't do it, you know. But I'm saying this is the kind of thing that happened all up and down. That is why this man wrote a book some years ago, Justice Higginbotham in a Matter of Color. Some, I'm sure some of you know the book. The man said, that he's not saying this for anger, he's not saying it from anger or anything, but the things, the, the legal, the American legal system has never been true, has never been honest with black people. And they have, they, have, they have messed up the lives of millions of black people by keeping them outside of the law and making another law for them. This has done it from the beginning and is doing it even more so today. So, I mean, one can have absolutely no trust in them because these are things that one knows. And the other thing too, we may not have looked at it that way, but I, I was very 
when I was with them originally, I was very young, and I grew up with them kind of thing. And uh, I grew up in their presence, you know, when, with them in the Air Force when I was there. I flew with a lot of them, white fellas, and, you know. They still used to have this thing, the fact that I was black, and I was, and I, I could, I was, you know, I was flying, I would fly with sometimes a couple of them, and I'd take them off in one of those twin engine um, mosquitoes that they had, I would fly off with them, you know. And I'll have white guys who were in the squadron, and I belong to the same squadron. And you know, after a while, or when it, I used to come back and, and escape, and many of them wanted to fly with me. Because they said, black brings luck. You know those stupos used to say that, they wanted to fly with me. And one of the things, even a guy I used to fly, Conroy, I used to, fly, I used to be with him a lot. And we, we, come up, we even shared the same, we, the same digs on, in, 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 on, 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 the, on the camp. And I was in one side, and he, on his dressing table, he had his girlfriend, some girl he was, he girl Helen, a girl he was engaged to. And the guy came up to me, we fly, we do all kinds of things together. I met his girlfriend, and you know, danced and so on with her, well, about it. He tells me once, he said, Ed, you know, I feel sorry for, for fellas like you. I said, well, Conrad, why, why? He said, look at you, a young fella, you fit, you fly, you fly around, and you have none of your, none of your women here in the country. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, I, we have our girlfriends, we're engaged, we, uh, we have, you know, we, we're all right, we have our own women here. Yeah. So I turned around and I got one blaze of anger. I told him, so that's what you believe? You believe that I'm here and I'm like a priest and a monk? Is what you believe? I said, why don't you go and ask your fiancé here? <laughs> Friendship broke immediately. <laughs> I had to, I removed, we removed, we, we, we shared the same. But that's the kind of thing they believe, you know? They're so superior. And, and there ain't nothing in it as there is, I can tell you nothing in that. But um, they're so superior, you know what I mean? And they can't even believe that one of their fine white Miss Daisies would bother with you, you know? That's what they believe. And that's the trouble is to keep them these days is away from you. I can tell you that. A lot of the boy the brothers fall victim to that. Any ball player in here? <laughs> no, seriously. But I'm saying even the, the belief these people have, the arrogance they have in their minds and their heads about us, whether you are educated, you not educated, no matter who you are. Once you have the badge of color, you 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 done in their eyes. Some of them will say, "Yes, he's not bad, you know, but you know why does why do so so many black people do that? You're not bad, you're different." I said, I'm no damn different. I have two legs, two arms, like everybody else. I'm no different to my brothers at all. The only thing that I know how to deal with you, that's the only difference, perhaps. And so this is what we have to understand. The lessons we have to take about with us, especially for our young people. Because they not go, they, although they worry with all, oh, they're killing all, all of us, whether we senior citizens or what, they're doing that. But the young brothers, you know, it's a, it's a known thing. If you don't have young brothers growing up, whether you kill them in some way, it means that your population is going to be affected later on. Because young brothers growing will leave, leave young sisters growing. And when they get rid of our young people, you know what they're expecting to do. That's why they always like to, every time, there's some kind of epidemic or anything. We are always topping the list, you notice that? We're always at the head of the list. It didn't take them long before they put us at the head of the list with AIDS. And there's a lot of phoniness and falseness in this AIDS thing too. There's a lot, a lot, a lot of it. And um, I hear people say last night, I was talking to someone and they said, you know, one thing I'll never do. She says, this is a woman that says, I would never advise anybody She's a middle-aged woman. She said, I've never advised any black woman to go to a hospital. She was saying that, you know, she was, and she's not a, really not onto this, you know, being African and so on. She said, a hospital, when they send you there as a black woman, they send you to come out in a box. That's what they send you. And especially what they do to you, they put a little rubber there, they tie your thing there, and you don't know what kind of injections they're giving you. And it's true. They never experiment on white people. Always on black people. Always on. You know all the things they had about their, 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 their um, things for, what they call it, um, Chinese um, flu, Japanese flu, pig flu, all kinds of flu, all kinds of things, Asian flu, all kinds of things they had. 
And you notice all this injection they were doing for t all those things in Africa. You know what kind of what the kind of solutions were going in those? Do we know? We don't. That's the thing that is very serious because they have a reputation. You remember doing the Tuskegee experiment, what they did with our people? Why did they choose white people to do it with them? We are the guinea pigs of the world in more ways than one, you know. Really, we are. They're, we are the ones that they're going, they're not experimenting on them. They are the natural, they are the norm. We are the abnorm and the not so norm, norm, you know. That's who we are. So let's see how we measure up to them. Who the hell wants to measure up with them? Who wants to? Have your own thing, and do your own thing. And this is something that we have to look into seriously. Because when you tie up certain things, when you remember this great thing during the Carter regime when they were talking about Global 2000, you remember what they were talking about? Ways and means of getting rid of a lot of black people, millions of black people. This is serious. We may not take it, we may not think so. We go to the job next morning and, and one, of the, one of them says, Hi Mike, how are you? Boy, man, what did you do? I mean, what did you do over the weekend? You think he's your friend. Not your friend. As you turn your back and say, look at that damn, you know. You know what I mean? They have no loyalty. The loyalty is to only this, their pockets. And the other thing that you, I hope you've noticed it, I can talk with a lot of authority about that. We are eaten, ridden, dying, living with sex on their minds, those people. From young to younger to older, all of them. They don't rise any higher. The kind of, you know the kind of sex they have in their mind? Perverted sex. That's the kind of mind they have. White people in that cannot go do anything normal. They have to do all kinds of abnormal things that not even a good donkey would do. You know, they do all kinds, and when I tell you all kinds of things, I mean all kinds of things. One of the most popular books, they're talking about banning those brothers or, or for obscenity and so on. One of the most popular books in England, way back in the 19th century, written by an English woman, was a, the book dealt with four young teenage girls, aged 16, 17, 18, and that, that age. And all four of them are telling you in the book how, they, how each and every one lost her virginity. That book was a bestseller. Upon our priests would have it in their gowns and everything. It was a bestseller. And that book is atrocious. They republished it in England. It's atrocious. And if you hear the things those girls are supposed to, were they written in the book, those of you who don't have here, it would give you here. You know? It would, or those of you who have it would give you more. It's a, it's a terrible book. And another book they have on prostitution. They call it The King's Mistress. That's the title of the book. And the people, the, the kind of prostitution that went on in London, London town, from time immemorial to even up until recently, would give you gray hairs in no time when you read that book. It is the most perverse book. And they have what they call a, a, a book, some pictures in the, in the National Museum, the National Gallery in near Trafalgar Square. They won't show those pictures. They'll show some. You have heard of William Hogarth, the great William Hogarth. They will show you some of his pictures. But they have some other pictures that they're hidden down in the basement. They will not show it. All of them deal with different pyrotechnics of sex. It would beat you. One of the pictures that they, they have in, in the museum there that they showed are famous. It is a masterpiece. It's costing hundreds and thousands of dollars for that picture. You know what the picture is about? And everybody, you know, they, said they won't let people under 18 go to see. You know what the picture did? Three white men are raping a black woman. That's a masterpiece, a Dutch masterpiece. Hundred, if you get it in your hand, you have hundred and thousand of dollars in your hand. You don't have to play the lotto to next Saturday. You don't. You got the lotto in your hands. These are the kind of things that you have. Are they talking about perversions? 
They made them. Africans don't go in for that. If some Africans know anything about these things, it's since they came into contact with those devils. Because one of their own writers, one of their own writers, did a kind of anthropological study and survey. You have, the book must be there, as everywhere. The Iceman Inheritance, you know it? And you know who's responsible for everything on the planet. Everything. And the, the man, Michael Bradley, accuses them of being racist in everything. They have done all kinds of negative things, not only with people and themselves, but with the planet. And so, we know where it comes from. The Afri African peoples who have taken part in that is not against, not only their will. We may have amongst us a few people who are strange, but strangeness in that sense is a purely Caucasoid pattern of behavior. Purely Caucasoid. Africans have nothing to do with it. It was brought to them and taught to them. And all the, the same thing, all the diseases they talk about. I have a question. You didn't ask any questions. Right. Um, you're talking about the African resistance uh, here in this hemisphere. Could you give us some uh, reference books yeah. about uh, the resistance that took place not only in the Caribbean, but also here? Yes. Well, one of the one of the main books that you could use is a new book. Um, the, the, um, it's called, um, it's by an African brother called Baptu, um, Baptu, um, Baptu, uh, it's, a, it's a recent book, but it deals with the African, the, the, the diaspora, that's in the diaspora, and it's a powerful book that deals with resistance throughout the, the other one is, um, the one you want is, um, Roger Bastille has a book, the uh, African cultures in the in the in the in the in the in this in the head in the head in this hemisphere. That's another book that has a lot about it. The other one is um, Columbus, his enterprise by um, what's his name by uh oh, his Columbus, his enterprise. That's one of the good books he has about. What's the name of the fellow? He's a he's a he's a he's white and he's a he's a Dutch origin, but he writes. And another one of, of Columbus, his Forge of Voyages of Columbus by Charles Duff. Uh, what's the name of that? Oh, I am. Uh, Hans, Hans Honey is the, the Columbus Enterprises by Hans Honey. And that's a very good book. It shows you the sham, the mockery, the whole thing about Columbus. The other thing is um, thing for Massacre. Um, yeah, something about Massacre by Ab Abdios Nascimento. And he has a whole thing about resistance in the Caribbean, in the, in the, in the Americas, mm -hmm. and especially with Brazil. And the other one, and the other one you see is Richard Price's book, um, Maroon Societies. I don't know if you, that's a well-known one. You get most of the things, and you and you get um, also a bibliography here where you can, you can get some more stuff. In it. There's also the um, this one by by. Um, Eric Williams' book, From Columbus to Castro, gives you a whole big thing on that. It's a massive book that gives you a lot of, of that material. And um, that's about it. The other one that, that deals with here is this, this um, the diaspora, the something diaspora by um, uh, back to, back, back to, um, back to, anyway, it's a, it's a new book. It deals from 1400 right up to the present time. It goes through all of the I'll, I'll, I'll remember the name will come back to me in a minute. Oh, just a minute. Just a minute. I must have it. I think I have it here. But uh, it gives you the whole, I'll give you a list of the books that I have here. In fact, I have a list of books. Don't tell me, I don't want to give. I left it at home. I left it in this room. But there's a whole list of books I can let you have. I can, you know, I can send it if you tell me where I'll send it to you. You send it to Brother Lee. Yeah, I'll give that But get uh, yeah, Williams' is book, Eric Williams' is book, Cap not capitalism, the history of the English people. I mean, the Afro Columbus of Africa. That has a lot of material, very, very much material, very well done too. And Massacre, or oh, Massacre on by Abios Nascimento, he's a Brazilian, and he's done a whole heap of genocide in the, in the Americas, and he deals with not only the Caribbean islands, but he deals with the Latin American countries too. A lot of that. And so you get you get tremendous amount of material. And um, 
there is also the Haitian, from the Haitian point of view, is a, is a call the Haitian, um, the Haitian, Haitian Maroons by, by Dr. Pouchard. He's a Haitian scholar. The book is translated from French into English. It's published by the Light Press and it's called Haitian Maroons um, by Dr. Pouchard, Jean Pouchard. That's where you see it here are in And it's a, it's a classic book with a lot of nice There's another, there's another one um, uh, it's done by white, uh, um, white and black. And it deals with uh, early, the early history of the main, the Spanish and the Brazilian areas of the Caribbean. It deals with the revolts and the changes that took place, particularly that part of it that deals with the Portuguese because we, we don't have too much dealing with the Portuguese. Um, Abdias Nascimento deals with the Portuguese and the, the resistance put up by the Africans. And as I told you, Richard Price in his book, he does a lot of that in the Maroon Society. And there's a new book that's just been published by um, African Free Press, African um, World African World Press here, in by um, Dr. Well, what's it? Chico, Chicoli, Cal Calhoun Chicoli. He's in, he's in, he's in, he's in, in uh, what's this place down past Princeton? It's the last, it's uh, New it's Jersey. Trenton. Uh -huh. Trenton. Trent. Trent. He, he's there, and it's a book called The Jamaican Maroons. It's a whole big work, not only about Jamaica, but dealing with all the Maroons. It's an, extent, an expansive book written by a sister called Mavis Campbell. It's just come out about four or five months ago. That's a good book to see you. And um, there's the other book by the Psychology, psychology Sociology of, of, of Slavery, Dealing with the Revolution, by Dr. Orlando, Mark, uh, Orlando Patterson. He's a Jamaican, but he teaches at um, Harvard. Um, his book is Sociology of, of, of Slavery and um, Resistance. That's a good book. It's for, there are lots of these books that are very, very good. Especially that, well, that last one, I guess. You know, I, I can't remember the author's name. I have two or something is his name. But it's been published only about a, a year now. And it's, it's a comprehensive work dealing with the whole dealing with North America, dealing with the Caribbean, dealing with the um, other Latin American countries, and it deals with great detail about that. So there's a lot of work to do. And it's worth doing to you, especially uh, dealing with the, the work the Portuguese were dealing with the Quilombos, because they had Quilombos like Slayers, Maroon societies, and as they call them, Quilombos. They had them all over Brazil, particularly the main one being the whole thing on uh, Zumbi in Palmares. And that film, I don't know if anybody has seen Colombo. Yes. They should I, those of you who haven't seen Colombo the film, please go and see it, you know. I had a I had a, a I taped it, I had a tape, I didn't tape to somebody, I haven't got it back yet. <laughs> uh, the entire film. But it's worth seeing. It's a powerful piece of work, you know. The certain parts of it I Remind them, December 1st at 6 p.m., Black Gold. The Black Gold. Oh, okay. Location. Right. Mm -hmm. Good. Location at the sun. Okay. Where you at the sun? At Black Gold, right. 500 watt charm. Yeah. In Plain Hill. It's a great film. You like it, especially. I remember the part when they were taking over the plantation from that white woman, you know, who was really in a like, thing like the Inquisition and saying what they were going to do with them. And next thing you see, I don't want to tell them what the films are, but it's a powerful film. You really see that is the resistance that they have hidden away from us. They prefer to tell us about nice, nice white people who are freeing us. You know, instead of seeing that film, it really moves you when you watch that film. And to see how people can behave together. One of the things in the film, I wish. <laughs> okay, it is a, it's a tremendous film. You, you must see it. Okay, uh, Sister Joy Whitley has an announcement okay. that she'd like to share with you. And then the brother has a question. A question. Okay, I just wanted to say before everyone left, um, this is... Yeah, yeah, right to the beginning. Do you have it in it? Do you have it in Creole, too? You know, I think there's an English translation. Well, as far as the information, though, if I'm going to buy what, one, I would buy the Irritated Jeans. Irritated Jeans? Yeah. By Jacob Carruthers. By Jacob Carruthers. Yeah. And the uh, second question is that uh, I did a little reading on the uh, Haitian Revolution. Yeah. And the, um, uh, the migration of Haitians, or supposedly the migration of Haitians, 
through um, Cuba yeah. uh, and to uh, coming into Louisiana. Yeah. Now, from what I understood, that the Europeans didn't want the um, the uh, Haitians to come to the United States because they were frightened of them after the beating that they gave the French or something like yeah. that, something like yeah. that. But from what I understand, it also had something to do with their fear that they, because they called them the Voodoo Warriors or something. Could you? Uh, and, and then there's some people who say that they actually uh, did use the esoteric powers to, uh, along with warfare, to uh, tackle the French. But could you elaborate on that move? Well, they did. They they used the Voodoo ceremony because it's a it's a well known ceremony. It's called, um, you know, in some of the places they call it the, the ceremony of the souls, and um, it takes place when you want to make contact with the ancestors, and it does do it through um, the it does it through dance and through drumming and through everything, and um, with the uh, hungan and with the priests taking part and the people who are there taking part. It has been done, and one person who I'll tell you, one person who witnessed it. Um, is somebody that we all here know very well, Dr. Ivan Van Sertiman. He went to Haiti to do some, to Brazil with the, 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 the Colombos to do some work there. And one of the things, he, in front of fact, he showed it to me. He was taking films, not a, a, a professional photographer was with him, taking films all the time of the ceremony. They had allowed him, they were doing, this was not one thing they were doing for, for um, the tourists. It was the real thing, and they allowed the brothers, they allowed Van Sertie because they had, a lot of the people there had known the, some of the leaders there had known about Van Sertima, and they allowed the photographer to take pictures. And they were taking pictures, and they had, there was a chicken, and there was a flea, and Van Sertima tells me that he shot, they shot more shots of that chicken and that flea because there was one of the dancers, a girl dancer, that was dancing, and the chicken and the flame seemed to have had a lot of effect on her, and as though her eyes were on all of every movement of every inch of that chicken, and they were taking those pictures. And he said, all the films are perfect, all the films are perfect, and they must have taken, he said, over a hundred shots of that, and not on one of the films disappeared. He said, you don't believe, I said, I come from that area, so I, I'm tending to believe it. He said, have a look at the film, have a look at it. He says, nothing happened to the camera. They could qualify, they didn't even, he didn't even bother, because they took films soon afterwards, and the films were showing, everything was showing on it. But of that chicken, and that, that period of time, you can't see anything. You only see a blurred picture. You don't see anything on that picture. And he since asked an expert, a food and expert, and told him, there comes a time of contact where the, the spirit of the ancestors, the soul force of the ancestors, has in fact got into the, to the, to the person, the dancer. And that you will not see, you won't even see her. You won't even see, you'll only see a blur. And I watched the film in his, in his, in his, in his home in, in, New, in New Jersey here. And I spoke to the photographer, Branch, William Branch. I said, but you're an expert, you're a television cameraman, you're everything. I said, he said, look, this is one of the things that my, in my memoirs I'm going to put in my book. This is one of the things that beat me. I cannot have, but they tell me this is what happened. He said, I cannot understand it. But that, I, this is a thing that I saw, the, I looked at the film, the rolls of films, the contacts that they had, and nowhere on those contacts, at that point, there's nowhere, and soon afterwards, you start seeing all the things. He, looked, he said he looked at his camera, when he came back, he examined, actually he examined the camera, whether he goes on an assignment, when he comes back, he always examines his camera and looks for things. No, there's nothing wrong with the camera at all. The films are the same, in point of fact, the role had not, the, this role of films they had had not finished. The continuation, the pictures on it, but nothing on that, on that thing. He said, they tell him the time that the, the ancestral spirit makes contact into the, into the body, of the, of, the, of, the, of the girl, that this thing happens at that time, when you do, the, it is the ancestor who takes over at the time. The ancestor really takes over. And one of the things that, again, if you see this, the thing that you would notice is the fact that um, people say that it's a put on. It's not a put on. That Sardina told me, this girl, when she was there, this was dancing with it and moving around. She was as she came and she was as normal as 
anything else. But he says, no drugs, no nothing could have gotten the way. He says, and Jesus answered him as an extremely observant man. And when he tells you that, he says he looked at every, he looked around, he looked, he did at every, that's the kind of man he is. And he cannot, he says, Ed, I cannot account for that at all. Branch, the man who took the picture, tells me he cannot, he cannot account for that. And um, the same Nassim I just mentioned to you a while ago, was telling that Sertima that that has happened. He himself, he's supposed to be a sage. He's, a, he's, a, he's an elder, and, and this, this Brazilian, African, African-Brazilian brother. And he says he has, he has, with his open, his naked eye, when he's involved, it is as though he takes him, and he can notice things there that other people, a few other people, there are a few people there would notice certain things that normally the rest of the people won't notice, see certain things. I told him, I said to him, like what? He says, you know, you see a complete divination, something completely, uh, something that's happening that we, it is only your third eye that can see. When I said, well, look, you know, all of this, if you're telling me that, I'm a normal person, I think. And I mean, I don't necessarily, he says, look, I'm telling you, I'm not making this thing up. That's mental. He's a, he's a long bearded, white bearded brother from, he's a powerful brother from Brazil. And he was telling me the same thing, that you notice things that other eyes will not see. And there is, he says, um, the same thing. I was talking to um, a brother who, I don't know if some years ago, he wrote a book called the, um, the, um, My Bush of Ghosts, a fellow called Amos Tutola. He's a Yoruba, an African, and he wrote The Palm Wine Drinker. I don't know if you've heard of those books. And he was talking to, to me once in London, he and another a Nigerian man called Cipriana Quincy. And they were telling me about Really, at certain times, they've been to certain ceremonies that they wouldn't. He said, "And I wouldn't even take you because I am seeing things and understanding things that you would not understand." And I said, "How?" He says, "It, it takes a sort of level of spiritual consciousness to get into that." And um, I said, "Well, can you write about it or write something about it?" He says, "I can't really. It's something that you have to to feel. I can write about the thing. I can write about you know if you're looking for things and that, but you wouldn't believe it the way it is written." And he says, it's not all of us who have it. And this guy wrote, Chutola wrote, the, My Palm Wine Drinker. And when you read that book, you hear, it's, to me, when I first read the book, he, it was weird. There was something about it. I said, well, how come you make all of these things alive to you, Amos? How come? He said, they're just alive to me. I'm a Yoruba. They're just alive to me. I said, there's something I'm missing there. He said, maybe you live too long on the other side of those people. <laughs> it's something he said, um, you know, I have, I have friend, African friends who I lived with, I shared apartments with, or flats as they call them. And these guys would, would talk to me, and one particular, El Ellis Comey, he was an um, Nkrumah's cousin, he was a student at that time. He says to me, Ed, I don't think I'm going to, to college today, I'm going to college. I said, well, he says, I know if I go down to college, the gods are not with me, the ancestors are not with me, I'm not going there, I'm staying home. To, I said, what you doing? He said, I'm going to meditate and, and, and pray to them. And um, I said, why? He says, if something happened to a friend of his, he says, and he knew very well that, that the, the professor, whoever he was going to, it was not right. It was just not right. Many times, many things he said to me, I could find out, I could see the guy was, you know, the guy was, and another thing he could do well is to, he seemed to be able to read people a lot. I think that's another thing. He said he would, he would tell me about it, go de delve into the, into the thing about reading people. And he tells me how, how he learned how to, he got how to do it when he was a boy with his grandmother, and how he began, and his grandfather as well. We have a person at City College now who's like that. I know him, I know if you see, see uh, Professor Kitemi. His father was one of the most highly respected doctors of African doctors, and he died. He's, he was they even put him. He was in one of the one of the big journal, medical journals. Now his Kitemi, the, the son, he has an office not far away from mine, and invariably he's right about something. He would be going and he'd be knocking on my door, um, and um, he would just say Elder, and I he wouldn't he, he wouldn't shout out Elder or anything like that or knock hard on the door. I would come out and tell him. I say, Kamoti, why you want to break down the door, man? You shout my name. Why are you shouting so? He says, I didn't. I whispered to you. I said, come on. 
<laughs> I said, well, that's not what I heard. He said, you want to go back in there again and I'll whisper to you, talk to you? And he's a Kikuyu, you know. And he would again have to think. It would sound the same way. And some people come to break the damn door down and I don't hear them. <laughs> <laughs> and, but this guy, he's, a lot of the things about his father did and so on. I was telling him about a pain I had and so on in my ankle. In my, I said, I bet his that I had sprained my ankle and had fractured it up when I was playing football years and years ago. He said, oh, that pain should go down, but I'll tell you. So I need to feel this right ankle here. And so, no, he says, I see that. You know they never cure your ankle properly. And he began to think, no, this ankle, I can kick stones with it. Now, you know, I'm doing a wall and I won't feel it. It's the better of this one. This one has never been injured before. This one here was the one. But there are these things. I wish I could explain them. You know, he, they, he tells me, they tell me a lot of things, those brothers, those African brothers that I, I've been with a long time. They tell me these things, but... I just cannot, you know, I, I feel, sometimes I feel it, while they're telling me I feel it, but I mean, uh, to say that I have the, the spiritual quality doesn't seem to, it doesn't seem to get there as though there's something hold, holding me back. But a lot of these things, he said, because, he, he tells me, Kitemi tells me, because you're half it, believing it, and you're half not believing it. I said, no, I want to see, he says, exactly, you don't have to see those things. You don't have to see that. You have to have special eyes. I said, what kind of special eyes? I have four of them already. He <laughs> tells me about special eyes. He says, no, you, you have to, you're not, you're not attuned to that. And I think I know what he's talking about. And there are lots of brothers, we see them, we think they're simple. They're not. A lot of the brothers that are like that. There are some things I've seen, you know, with, with them that has happened, that has amazed me. Their, their approach and things. He tell me something about it, give me a whole history about somebody's behavior. And then, then later on you find out that, you know, one of the professors, that's how he really, that's how he behaved when you were growing up. Lots of things about him. He said, I can see a lot of things that happened to him when he was younger. So I said, well, you take up your, like, he does that, you know, they ask him, he does a lot of baptism, he does a lot of things like that. Now for people, this brother Kitane, you see him there many times, you know, when you come to the office. Yeah. Uh, your lectures, one of the things that you stressed are uh, the fact that we uh, had many of the same contradictions during slavery, uh, which we have today. And uh, one of the things that often mystifies me is that we keep making the same mistakes over and over and over. Despite the fact that you had slavery both on every island in the Caribbean, as you had mentioned, yeah. as well as in this country, but we still keep selecting leaders with that slave mentality. Pervasive in the Caribbean is pervasive yeah. here. Yeah. I want to ask, uh, how do we kind of break that cycle of producing this kind of questionable leadership? I, you know, among ourselves, one of the things that we are trusting people for, uh, to begin with, we give people the benefit of the doubt. We're not a, we're not a warring people, really. Though. We might quarrel with each other, but deep down, we don't have the same mentality to do somebody really bad that has done us harm. We have that quality, and we always feel the next man or the next person will be better than the one before, and that is never the case. We don't if we don't bother to go too deeply. Once it's one of our people, and it has to be very blatant for us to go into it and say, well, look. And we even say, give him another chance, and so on. And we've done that repeatedly, repeatedly. And we can see now, looking back, we can see who the one. You only have to look back a short while. And who do you notice was one of the most powerful politicians? And Tim Powell Jr. Look at what he did. I mean, he was in a position of power, and he used it for our people. And look at another man, about one. He's Alan Quayton Powell would be much, much older than Dinkins. And look at, look at the present mayor of, of New York. Look at him. In no way, in no way has he done anything to benefit us. At least, when somebody died or something happened to William Cops did something, Koch, for all his insincerity, would go and make a statement and talk about it. It's like Dinkins had never heard of the people who have been murdered and killed. He has never even, but look what he did. He comes into a supermarket and buys orange juice. Yeah. And while, I mean, he would not stand up 
and say like the, 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 uh, the, the poor, our poor sister that was killed in the Bronx. The man would make a statement about it, come out and make a statement like a man. In any case, he's only there for one term anyway, so he might just as well make that statement now, because he's not going to be there again. Not many blacks are going to vote for him, and in any case, it's going to be a white guy that's going to be there the next time. He came in by the skin of his teeth. Look how he bent over backwards with the Jews. The only thing they didn't do is to kick his behind. Or they may have done and we don't know. Or he, and the, and the white vote, that Giuliani who's a, a horror, he got more white votes than Dinkins did. And that man was, is terrible. And they could vote for a monster ahead of Dinkins. Because Dinkins is black. You talking about you're a mayor for everybody. I disagree with you. You mustn't be a mayor for everybody where there is so uneven in the society. The ones that have not been included when other mayors there have been us. Koch, Koch went in there and everything was Jewish. If you went to Gracie Mansions, or went, everything is Jewish in there. Everywhere you go is Jewish people. You have a duty to, to look after those who were not looked after in New York so that everybody can make a mosaic or whatever you call it. To bring black people up to par, you have to spend much more of your time and effort and energy with black your, your people. The man can't even say that. I'll say my people have not got, have not, have got um, have not been treated right. I'm going to treat them right so that they can come on par with Jews and, and Italians and everybody. Then I can look and say that I'm a mayor for everybody. But I have first to be a mayor for my people who be left down all the time. He can't even say that. What kind of man is that? For all his education, everything is not worth us a light. <laughs> and so this is the kind of thing that happens. Isn't it? They get there and they have to worry about their, their jobs and their vote. If people look, if people vote for you, they vote for you. If they don't vote for you, they don't vote for you. Because you did something wrong and they didn't vote for you. So you go there and do the right thing. Whatever it costs you, do the right thing. I can say that, I know that. One of the most popular men in the island of Dominica went among the bourgeois and said, I was one of them. Point of fact, I, I won't even go into that story. It's too long a story to go into. But I said, look, the people, the grassroots people matter. I'm there to help them, and I'm going to help them. I said, if you all don't want to vote for me, that's your business. Don't vote for me. I don't want your votes. If, you, if it's for you want me to vote to be nasty and bad and rude to my to, to, to the grassroots people, you're getting a wrong person. And I didn't care what happened. They stole me on the oil, they did all kinds of things. You know, people telling me, I went to school with some of these, and, oh, I used to, you, I, you were my friend up to now, I've given up our friendship. I said, your friendship hasn't worth me a damn thing. In any case, I used to help you when you we went to school together. Would you tell me about your friendship? <laughs> I said, your friendship doesn't matter. Because I wrote something about the, the banks, what the, how the banks, the, the, the foreign banks were ripping them off. How the, 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 uh, the insurance companies were ripping them off. And I was saying that how the people that came there, the Arabs and the Lebanese and so on that came there, were ripping them off. And I kept writing that and saying that they should get rid of them. It's not good. Make them invest there. The people that put money and stand in the line and put money in those banks are poor people that are working on the plantations. They're working and slogging their guts and working in the hot sun. They're the ones that are lined up there and put their money. You help the country. You invest in the country. You're taking all your money and sending it to South Africa. One of the bank managers who I went to school with, you know, I used to call him Baz, his head was so damn big. And uh, he said, oh, Ed, I didn't know you were so, I said, well, you know now. You know now. I said, you, instead of sending your money, to, instead of sending the money to South Africa, give, don't give a little carnival queen a little bit. You come up to Florida, you come to New York for to see all the racism up here. Give her a little trip. I said, I can give her a trip if that's what you, all you can do. Give a little scholarship to a girl for $500 a year scholarship. I said, invest big money in the island. That's what you must do. They're not about doing that at all. So you can see it'll happen. They vote for you, they vote for you. They don't vote for you, they don't vote for you. To be continued. <laughs> has to go back to the city. That's the only reason why I'm cutting him off. And he is just winding up, not winding down. So I have to save him from himself. I promise you, he'll be back.